Hello and welcome to the Global Humanities Initiative. I'm Stuart Holliday, and we're delighted you could join us today. This initiative is a partnership between the National Endowment for the Humanities and Meridian International Center. And we're very excited uh, to bring you an array of speakers and scholars today who will be examining through a historical lens uh, international cultural diplomacy in all of its dimensions. Uh, for decades now, Meridian has been a practitioner of cultural diplomacy and has used the power of culture to unite people and bring together people to understand different perspectives. And it's in that vein uh, that we joined with the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, to elevate this important issue so that we can examine cultural diplomacy from a historical standpoint with a, with a view to making it better in the future. And uh, it, it's a great pleasure now to uh, introduce Mr. Adam Wolfson, the acting chairman of National Endowment for the Humanities. Great, th th thanks very much. Uh, good morning, I'm Adam Wolfson, uh, acting chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'd like to congratulate Ambassador Holliday, Terry Harvey, Lindsay Amini, and the entire Meridian team for today's event. We at NEH are pleased to be a part of this symposium and to be able to help support Meridian's two-year global hum humanities initiative through our cooperative agreement with them. Today's panels explore important examples of international cultural exchange, the role of museums as sites of cultural diplomacy, and the digital humanities potential for bridging diverse cultures in dynamic and accessible ways. The scholars you'll be hearing from today represent a broad range of perspectives on the humanities as they speak to the role that the humanities can play in helping all of us find common ground. We hope that these discussions will inspire students of diplomacy, but also general audiences interested in learning about US cultural diplomacy, past and present. Today's symposium and the Global Humanities Initiative received NEH funding as a part of the agency's A More Perfect Union initiative. This special initiative encourages projects that explore our quest to form a more just and inclusive society throughout our history. NEH first developed the initiative in preparation for the United States' 250th anniversary, but the initiative encompasses the broad sweep of American history, including our country's relationship with other nations throughout its history. NEH's founding legislation states in its Declaration of Purposes that the United States' place in the world in world affairs, and, and, and I quote, cannot rest solely upon superior power, wealth, and technology, but must be solidly founded upon worldwide respect and admiration for the nation's high qualities as a leader in the realm of ideas and of the spirit. The realm of ideas is, of course, central to the work of the humanities and how we understand our country's place in the world. Over the years, NEH has supported a range of projects involving international collaborations and international themes. Our support of Meridian's Global Humanities Initiative is a part of this valuable work, while also helping us to further President Biden's goal, as stated in his inaugural address, of strengthening America's place in the world. I hope you will enjoy this day of lively discussions. Thank you, and now back to you, Ambassador Holliday. Thank you, Adam. Before we get to our panelists, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, a good friend of Meridian and a good friend of mine, Ambassador Glenn Davies, uh, to give our keynote. Ambassador Davies uh, is a three-time ambassador, a veteran foreign uh, service officer who served his country admirably uh, in, in various parts of the world. And we came to work with Ambassador Davies in an incredible partnership to try to implement a vi vision he had when he was ambassador in Bangkok to take and put together an exhibition of uh, history, of gifts uh, and expressions of gratitude between uh, Thailand and the United States going back uh, to the last century. And this exhibition was a big hit in, in Thailand. And it was conceived by Ambassador Davies, who used his role as an ambassador to sort of branch out beyond the traditional uh, political and economic work of the ambassador, but to take a cultural diplomacy initiative and put it into action. Uh, and he did that partnering with the private sector. And uh, we were, we were uh, grateful to be uh, his partner in implementing that program, working also with Smithsonian and the Library of Congress, uh, whose collections these were, uh, to bring this to the people of Thailand. Uh, 
So Glenn, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, Stuart. It's uh, great to be gathered together under the auspices of Meridian and the National Endowment for the Humanities to talk about the positive power of cultural diplomacy to promote friendship and understanding across borders. I commend our hosts on choosing this moment to present this symposium. Most nations are faced with the same diabolical set of threats, the four horsemen of our age, extremes of climate, politics, disease, and disinformation. In this world of extreme challenges now more than ever, we need to concert our efforts to improve international understanding and to strengthen the ties that bind us. So I salute Meridian and NEH for this initiative and thank all of you for contributing to the effort. On a personal level, this is a great occasion. It's an honor to share virtual space with so many colleagues committed to the same great cultural cause. Stuart, Adam Wilson, Dr. Richard Curran, Terry Harvey and his team, Brad Smith and Trevor Marion, and of course, all of the presenters, panelists, and attendees. Thanks for including me in this important discussion. Now, if you were watching television 50 years ago, as I was, you might remember a BBC TV series called The Ascent of Man. The series was conceived, written, and hosted by a British mathematician and historian named Jacob Bernowski. It was sweeping and thought-provoking, 13 episodes covering 400,000 years of human civilization. And as a kid, I was enthralled by it. The final scene from Bernowski's episode on the 20th century stuck with me and helped inform my philosophy of cultural diplomacy when I joined the Foreign Service in 1980. In the scene, Bernowski is standing next to a shallow lake, dressed in a suit and tie, with the barbed wire and blockhouses of Auschwitz in the background. The lake, he explained, was where the Nazis disposed of the remains of their victims. Bernowski declared that a repetition of such a monstrous crime could only be avoided if nations and people worked harder to build understanding with those different from them. As the camera panned out, Bernowski walked into the lake up to his ankles, bent down, grabbed a handful of dripping mud, and holding it up to the camera said, you have to touch people. That was an arresting image and a thought-provoking exhortation to ensure peace you have to touch people. I never forgot that admonition. It became my mantra when I worked on cultural diplomacy efforts as a diplomat. How can we touch people so they understand who we Americans are? How can we break down stereotypes and convey positive images of friendship and cooperation? I saw many striking examples of cultural diplomacy growing up. My father was also a diplomat, a foreign service officer uh, during the Cold War. He was a Soviet specialist. So my earliest memories in life are of the fear and foreboding in Moscow, where my father served and where we lived at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. That childhood experience is no doubt why Bernowski's words impressed me later in life. Living in Europe and Asia as an adolescent and teenager, I saw, the, I saw the sort of positive impact cultural diplomacy could have. Jazz quartets, movies, and dance troops wowed them in Warsaw in the 1970s. When we lived in Calcutta, I marveled at the drawing power of the US Cultural Center there. The US government was printing millions of copies of local language magazines about American life for distribution to schools across the subcontinent. Visiting astronauts and Hollywood celebrities drew huge crowds. So as my wife Jackie and I prepared to travel to Bangkok in the fall of 2015, I had all of that in mind. I knew the power of cultural diplomacy, but how could we employ it to strengthen ties with Thailand in the 21st century? We'd have to come up with something dramatic since all was not well in the US Thailand relationship. First, Thailand's longtime ruler, King Rama IX, was ailing and could no, no longer serve as a calming presence. The only king ever born in America, Rama IX had been a staunch ally and friend of the U.S. during his almost 70 years on the throne. 
Second, China was busy in Southeast Asia, using its money and might to win over Thailand's successful ethnic Chinese minority. Many members of Bangkok's elite gravitated to China's side and blamed the United States for raising regional tensions. Yes, Thailand's leaders decided Beijing was wrong to see the, seize the, the South China Sea through which most of Thailand's exports flowed, but it was Washington's criticism of China that was truly destabilizing the region. And there was a third and final factor affecting our relationship. A coup d'etat in 2015 had unseated Thailand's democratically elected government and brought a military junta to power. Bangkok's elites were unhappy when Washington criticized the coup. Things became so bad that my predecessor, Ambassador Christy Kenny, was hung in effigy by royalist Buddhist monks in front of the US embassy in Bangkok. So that was the challenge we faced. Thailand was in an existential funk as its king neared the end of his 70 year reign. A military coup had reversed the country's democratizing trend and China was exploiting the turmoil. US Thailand relations were at a low point. How could we change the minds of ordinary ties about America and Americans and rekindle our longstanding friendship and alliance? How could we counter the negative messages about us from the junta and the kingdom's elites? We had to find a way to go over the heads of Bangkok's China leading establishment to get a message of friendship across to the 70 million ordinary ties across the kingdom. All of this was on my mind as we prepared to travel to Bangkok. I thought the answer lay to our challenge lay in refreshing the story of our friendship by reminding ties of how we came to know each other in the first place and stressing our people to people connections. I decided we had to rewrite the origin story of our re relationship. For as long as anyone could remember, the United States and Thailand first came together when we signed a trade treaty in 1833. Henceforth, everyone considered that the start of our relationship. But it's hard to get excited about a treaty, no matter how consequential. A treaty is an agreement between states, not so much a connection between people. We needed something more tangible, technicolor, and inspiring which is why we turned our attention to the Smithsonian's remarkable collection of gifts from the kings of Siam and later Thailand, exquisite art and artifacts dating back to the early 19th century. The kings of Siam and Thailand were great gift givers, generous and thoughtful. They understood the power of cultural diplomacy and they sent literally boatloads of intricately woven silks and baskets, bejeweled swords, religious items, as well as everyday crafts to convey how Thais lived and farmed and fished. The erudite English-speaking King Mong Kut of King and I fame was particularly avid in his gift giving. The gold court implements inlaid with niello and shimmering silks he sent to President Franklin Pierce were not just beautiful works of art, but served as a symbolic invitation to the court of Siam. King Mong Kut sent a sword with a gold staff scabbard to President James Buchanan. After many months on the high seas, the sword was received and admired by Buchanan's successor, Abraham Lincoln. King Mong Kut's son, Chua Longhorn, the great Rama V, was even more generous and purposeful. He dispatched entire elaborate pavilions to the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia to Chicago's 1893 World's Columbian Exposition and to the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis. The Siamese pavilions were a huge hit with the American public, according to local accounts. Among hundreds of other gifts, Rama V sent intricate religious items such as alms bowls and prayer fans and a remarkable chantaboon or woven reed map to the St. Louis Exposition. He personally directed that it, along with hundreds of other objects, be sent to the Smithsonian. America's greatest museum was already famous across the world. 20th century Thai monarchs continued the practice of gift giving. The reign of King Bumipun, Rama IX, 
spans 70 years and 12 presidents. A number of presidential libraries from this period contain his gifts. The Eisenhower and Johnson libraries house handsome and yellowware desk sets. The Nixon and both, and both Bush libraries boast beautiful gifts, such as a golden apple encrusted with diamonds, a gift from Queen Sirikit to Laura Bush. King Rama the Ninth and Queen Sirikit also gave gifts directly to the Smithsonian and to other institutions. Rama the Ninth presented a collection of traditional Thai instruments to the Library of Congress. Might we bring a selection of these exquisite items to Bangkok for an exhibition to show the Thai people what marvels their ancestors produced and to illustrate how our friendship began and flourished? I knew the Smithsonian collection had to be at the heart of what we did. Every one of the thousands of items sent over the centuries by Thai kings to American presidents and expositions was meant for one purpose, to strengthen the ties between our two nations and peoples and to show Americans what life was like in Siam. The gifts had performed that function when they first arrived in America, but had largely been in retirement to all except scholars ever since. With new challenges to our bilateral relationship emerging in the 21st century, it was time once again to put those gifts to work, to bring them out of retirement for an encore, to re-enlist them in their original diplomatic purpose. We would employ the gifts in an exhibition that would serve as a return gift to the Thai people, thanking them for their friendship and showing them for the first time what marvels their ancestors had created. Thus began a years long effort to hone our narrative, identify and procure the artifacts to bring that narrative to life, raise $4 million to cover costs and then make it all happen in a kingdom with a new king and a newly established military dominated government skeptical of American intentions. I was fortunate I had a great team at our embassy spearheading the effort led by our, our impressive public affairs officer, Minnie Masanis. The linchpin of our narrative was a little known historical anecdote that the first recorded American visitor to Siam was a Massachusetts sea captain named Stephen Williams who came to Bangkok in the summer of 1818 seeking sugar. He left with a hold full of the sweet stuff as well as a letter from the kingdom's foreign minister to President James Monroe proposing further trade. Now, could we prove that? Might that original letter from Monroe still exist? I hope so, because the year 1818 was perfect. An exhibition in 2018 could mark the bicentennial of that first friendly contact, an American merchant seeking to trade and a Siamese noble seizing the moment to reach out to the, the new United States of America. Our two terrific curators, Trevor Marion and Brad Smith, found the original letter in the Monroe papers at the Library of Congress, where I had the pleasure of seeing it and of thanking the library for lending it to us. That letter, by the way, was not a letter from Monroe, but from his correspondent, the Foreign Minister of Siam. The next moment in the 200 year story of our friendship was President Lincoln's correspondence with King Mankut, the erudite of Rama IV. Mankut had sent Lincoln's predecessor, James Buchanan, a letter offering to send a, a mating pair of elephants to the US to establish that useful species here as beasts of burden. Lincoln responded in the midst of the Civil War in a letter scholars use as, as an example of his gracious style. Our most famous president used the salutation, great and good friend, to address the Siamese monarch, giving our exhibition its name. Lincoln politely declined the king's elephant offer, explaining that our colder climate could not sustain the top the tropical beasts. The National Archives provided us the original Mankut letter and a copy of Lincoln's reply. And just as an aside, Ken Burns, who rarely made mistakes in his famous documentary on the Civil War, asserted that Mankut offered to send war elephants to help fight the Civil War, the truth as I've explained, is much more peaceful and prosaic. So Brad and Trevor scoured the Smithsonian's vaults 
and extended their search to presidential libraries. They found remarkable objects in no fewer than 10 of them. And the libraries were excited to participate in an international museum show. This was the first time such a broad consortium of leading national institutions, the Smithsonian, Library of Congress, National Archives, and so many presidential libraries had all lent objects to an overseas exhibition. The FDR library sent uh, a gold cigarette case that told a tale of spycraft and wartime intrigue. It was sent clandestinely as a gift to FDR from the King's Regent, who was in hiding in Japanese occupied Thailand. A note stamped secret from OSS Chief Wild Bill Donovan explained its origin to FDR. From all points of the compass, remarkable objects came, antique models of royal barges, a nobleman's coat of woven gold, traditional Thai musical instruments. We also tracked down some gifts from American presidents to Thai kings and displayed them as well. Notably, a Rembrandt Peel portrait of Washington sent by President Pierce. The exhibition had a pricey high, high price tag. We raised $4 million from both American and Thai companies. Chevron, Citibank, Ford, 3M, Jim Thompson, and a number of leading Thai corporations jumped on board. Google signed up to help. Thailand is one of the most wired countries in Southeast Asia. And during the exhibit's opening, the Google Thailand landing page touted it. The McDonald's affiliate, McThai, printed millions of paper placemats for children to play word and picture games about the history of Thai-US friendship. Major Cineplex, the kingdom's largest operator of movie houses, ran a short spot at every screening to advertise the bicentennial and museum show. That same short film played repeatedly on television, in Bangkok subway stations, and on billboards across the country. We developed curricula to teach the story of Thai-US friendship in primary and secondary schools. In my trips to the provinces, I horrified high school teachers by inviting their students at school assemblies to take out their cell phones and themselves take a virtual tour of great and good friends on the Google Arts and Culture website. You can check it out yourself on artsandculturegoogle.com. We trained Thai docents to take school groups around the exhibition, including for the first time in Thailand, the hearing impaired. Bangkok's National Museum and the Queen Sirikit Museum at the Royal Palace, which housed the exhibition, as well as the Royal Thai Ministry of Culture and other institutions were deeply engaged in the effort. The conservation work done on many artifacts, particularly the textiles, was of great interest to Thai museums new museum relationships were forged. We invited the new king, Rama X, to preside at the exhibition's opening. To the surprise of many, he came. It was the first time in his short reign he had accepted any bilateral invitation, which sent a positive signal to the Bangkok establishment and perhaps to the Chinese embassy as well. So doors were now open to us in a way they hadn't been before. The exhibition was supercharged by the king's presence. TV, newspapers, and social media covered the opening extensively. Our message of friendship was breaking through in a big way. I believe the exhibition touched the Thai people. It was a gesture of respect that reminded them of America's 10 generation long commitment to our friendship. The gesture differentiated us from other countries, especially China, which take a more transactional approach to the countries of Southeast Asia. It muted the voices that had been critical of us, and I believe it sets us up well for our third century as great and good friends. I've enjoyed sharing our foray into cultural diplomacy with you. We may never again have the public resources for such efforts that we had during the Cold War, but our experience in, ba in Bangkok taught us that the 21st century can be a golden age for cultural diplomacy if we leverage private resources and draw on the goodwill of our cutting edge museums and leading cultural institutions, such as Meridian and the National Endowment. This Global Humanities Symposium is timely, expansive, and exciting. I thank you all for taking part. 
Thanks too for listening uh, to my story of one embassy's effort after observing the challenges we faced to partner with our finest national cultural institutions and build bridges to people in a critical corner of the world. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ambassador Davies. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Curran, who uh, has been in almost every leadership position at the Smithsonian and has served as provost, ambassador at large, undersecretary in a variety of uh, divisions, uh, both history, culture, uh, spearheading the Folk, Folk Life Festival, which everybody uh, knows about. And he's also worked uh, diplomatically to create really a, a, a framework treaty for cultural diplomacy and cultural heritage, really, uh, with over 180 countries participating. And it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Richard Curran. Over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be with you with Meridian House and uh, the uh, NEH uh, and all of you today that are uh, viewing this, uh, th this session. Uh, this panel is going to look at uh, cultural exchange, and I have a distinguished group of uh, folks, uh, scholars uh, joining me, uh, Nick Pozek, uh, Roseanne Sia, and Madison Leeson, who you'll meet in a moment. Uh, but uh, first, I'd uh, like to give a, a shout out to, uh, to Ambassador Davies and uh, our work together on uh, the Great and Good Friends uh, exhibit. Uh, in in uh, Bangkok, uh, you know, the Smithsonian holds about 165 million objects, scientific, cultural, historical, artistic, uh, that really document life on the planet uh, and uh, human relationships and history. And we're glad to use that for educational purposes. Uh, as uh, as Ambassador Davies uh, said, you know, the, our work, his work is both professional and personal, and so is mine. Uh, I'm a, a kid born in New York City, came to the Smithsonian, uh, studied anthropology, did most of my work in South Asia, uh, but had an opportunity uh, as, a, as a young guy uh, to work for the Smithsonian in 1976, our uh, bicentennial of the United States. And, um, and that was a time where the United States itself was figuring out its own relationship uh, with with the world and working with the Folklife Festival as I did on that summer, uh, we we were looking at the roots of our own culture. Where does where do American culture, where this diversity of American culture came in? And I think what was really resounding to me at that time was that it, it, the Smithsonian took a, a very grassroots look at the United States and the culture of the people who who made it. And so we initiated programs in the African diaspora, for example. And, and that really kicked off not only scholarly research and studies, but idea of who we were as, as a people. We work very closely with native people and tribes and communities across the hemisphere to represent their culture and, and the diversity of, of various uh, uh, ethnic groups and, 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 and people who come to the country. And I guess as we look, and uh, our NEH uh, chair is, uh, uh, has expressed, as we look toward our 250th anniversary of America, it occasions us through these cultural programs to also reimagine our own, our, our, our own identity <laughs> and our own place in the world. And sometimes what seemed so uh, prescient and so, so, so resoundingly obvious maybe 50 years ago may, maybe has to be looked at somewhat critically <laughs> and reexamined and reformulated today. And I think that's always happening through U.S. cultural diplomacy. Uh, it's not divorced, as Ambassador Davies has noted, it's not divorced uh, from uh, where we stand uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, politics where we stand in terms of national interests and how we navigate interests versus larger transcendent human values like human rights and so on. So um, I, I, I think as we look at these programs, uh, they involve some not only introspection, but also scholarly examination uh, and, and understanding. Uh, on a personal note, not only have I been kind of an example or a pawn or a, 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 a token or a, an actor in cultural diplomacy in terms of my role in the Smithsonian, because we're involved in cultural exchange like every day, <laughs> but, but um, 
but but also uh, as a Fulbright scholar, I was working in Pakistan uh, at a very tough time of Pakistani U.S. relationships, and and trying to in in my own in my own life in my own professional standing um, uh, adjust that with my relationships with my Pakistani friends. I ended up marrying a woman I met in Pakistan. She was the daughter of a uh, U.S. State Department cultural affairs guy who had done his, most of his work in um, post-independence Africa, representing the United States in Congolese villages in Guinea, West Africa, and the Ivory Coast and other places. And so I feel my, my whole family indeed is involved in this sphere. And um, you know, it's a matter of things of really trying to wrestle with stuff, to appreciate the role that culture plays in understanding our fellow human beings and, and, and adjusting and dealing with the very complex nature of our own national interest. And that, that, that indeed is its own kind of uh, intellectual and emotional uh, and personal uh, 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 dance. So um, I look forward to what our panelists have to say. I think everybody is looking indeed in, in an in a, in a, in a intellectual and uh, critical way at various forms of internet of US and international cultural exchange and how that pans out in particular situations. And so our first speaker, Nick Posick, is the assistant director of the Parker School of Foreign and Comparative Law at Columbia University, he has degrees in arts management and business, and of course, uh, uh, law. And um, his paper today is uh, titled Museums, Industrialists in Asia, the Philanthropist that Fostered cultural exchange and it looks like uh, looks at uh, why industrialists uh, like Andrew Carnegie like John Rockefeller uh, prioritized cultural exchange specifically between the United States and Asia Nick all right can I have my slides please perfect all right First and foremost, I want to thank the organizers of this conference for including me in this program and their superb coordination bring together this event in which I'm honored to participate. Uh, and thanks to Dr. Corinne for both that fantastic introduction and for chairing this session, and to my fellow panelists for what I'm certain will be an engaging conversation. I also want to thank everyone watching online for joining this early in the morning or late in the evening, depending where you are. In the brief amount of time that I have, I'm going to talk about the intersection of philanthropy and cultural exchange vis-a-vis -vis the progressive era titans of industry and their legacies, in particular Andrew Carnegie and a successive line of Rockefellers, John D. Rockefeller Sr., who I'll refer to as Sr., John D. Rockefeller Jr., Jr., and John D. Rockefeller III, um, whose nickname was as a child Demi, but I will call him uh, the third. For Carnegie, I'll examine his incremental and iterative approach to philanthropy within his own life. For the Rockefellers, I'll explore the intergenerational focusing of their scope um, of their philanthropy. Let's see, next. There we are. Either by their own admissions or their biographers, philanthropists supporting arts are often flatteringly situated within the history of arts patronage. In his manifesto, Gospel of Wealth, Andrew Carnegie claimed that without wealth, there can be no Messinas, uh, to draw a connection between his philanthropy and the classical patrons of the poets Virgil and Horace. Frank Crowenshield referred to John D. Rockefeller Jr. as the Lorenzo de Michi of the 20th century. And the shorthand connection became the title of Susan LaBelle's 2010 book, America's Medicis, The Rockefellers and Their Astounding Cultural Legacy. However, recent literature offers a revived critique of philanthropic practice. I don't necessarily want to interrogate the effectiveness of philanthropic work itself, but instead recognize that as Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Michael Bloomberg, and Mark Zuckerberg are met with skepticism today, so were the progressive era philanthropists like Carnegie and the senior Rockefeller in their time. I don't dispute that there are certainly business interests that overlap with, inform, and influence their philanthropy. But I argue that there is nuance, especially in the decision to fund the arts distinct from other pursuits. And I want to explore the paths by which Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller III arrived at the conclusion that cultural exchange and cultural institutions can serve the interest of global peace building. 
John D. Rockefeller founded Standard Oil Company in 1870 until he retired it, as its largest shareholder, making him the wealthiest American of his time. Rockefeller had an earnest commitment to philanthropy from an early age, and his donations were largely directed towards denominational causes. Religion had a significant weight in Rockefeller's life, and it would be through the missionary system that his philanthropic work would be realized. Standard Oil became, I'm sorry, Standard Oil began marketing kerosene as lamp fuel in China as early as the 1890s, and the nation quickly became Standard Oil's largest market in Asia. In 1914, the Rockefeller Foundation created the China Medical Board, a nonprofit organization to promote health and education and research in Chinese medical universities. John D. Rockefeller would hold a seat on the Chinese Medical Board, a, a role in which he would later share with his only son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., who would increasingly come to take an active role as a philanthropic advisor to the senior Rockefeller. Junior also developed an aesthetic appreciation for the art of Asia, imploring his father to support his purchase of Chinese porcelain, acquisitions that he argued had educational merits beyond their aesthetic value. Living with material culture of Asia would set the groundwork for growing interest in the region. The Junior Rockefeller expanded the global reach of the Rockefeller family and supported several significant projects in Asia, including Lingnan University in China, St. Luke's International Hospital in Tokyo, and the Library of the Imperial University in Tokyo. In the US, he further championed broader internationalist causes, including the League of Nations and the Council on Foreign Relations. John D. Rockefeller III would continue to hold a seat in the Chinese Medical Board, and his father and grandfather had, but he would do so with an increasing interest in Asia more broadly. When the Second World War erupted, uh, the third served as a naval officer in military government, where he would help draft instructions sent to General Douglas MacArthur upon assuming command of the occupation of Japan. Following the war, John Foster Dulles asked Rockefeller to join his embassy as a consultant on cultural affairs, as Dulles negotiated a peace settlement with Japan. Shortly thereafter, the third Rockefeller would revitalized the moribund Jap Japan Society here in New York, um, where he served as president from 1952 to 1969, then becoming chairman of the board until his death in 1978. He concurrently founded the Asia Society in 1956. Both organizations were devoted to fostering cultural exchange, business and educational exchanges between the East and the West. He had designed Asia Society with a vision, as he put it, to, quote, contribute to broader and deeper understanding between the peoples of the United States and Asia, end quote. From the beginning, arts would become central to this mission, presenting performances by dancers, musicians, and actors, as well as exhibitions of visual arts. Asia Society became a portal connecting the two continents through culture. Following his parents' passion for the material culture of Asia, he would donate more than 300 objects spanning centuries and from across Asia to create the core of the Asia Society Museum's collection. Further, and if that wasn't enough, in 1963, he established the Asian Cultural Program of the JDR3 Fund, um, specifically to promote cultural exchange in the arts between the United States and Asia. The program not only funded the projects of cultural organizations, uh, you know, exhibitions and performances, but also directly supported the work of artists and scholars. Andrew Carnegie was a contemporary of Rockefeller Sr. Um, unlike Rockefeller, however, Carnegie was an immigrant born in Dumfrieland, Scotland, and he had emigrated to the, United, to the US at the age of 12 with his parents in 1848. He accumulated his wealth through his investments in the Carnegie Steel Company, which he sold in 1901. Um, Andrew Carnegie observed in America rife with anti-Asian sentiment, and we often do talk about Andrew Carnegie's observations on anti-Asian sentiment. But he was repulsed by the xenophobia underpinning the Naturalization Act of 1870 and the Page Act of 1875. Reflecting on the treatment of Chinese immigrants, he wrote, quote, it is preposterous to believe there's anything in the agitation against them beyond the usual prejudice of the ignorant races next to them in the social scale, end quote. And he penned this, in fact, as he traveled by boat in 1878 to China, accompanied by his business partner, John Van der Vogt, who he affectionately called Vandy. On this trip, he would visit China, Japan, and India, 
In each country, Carnegie made observations about the country's culture, religion, and of course, economy. Carnegie's travel logs were his first publications, and the musings that were interspersed within the travel narrative expanded into his ideas on business and policy that were the topics of his later books. But within the travel logs, specifically in recounting his travel through Asia, he describes his voracious consumption of local culture. Although he expressed a distaste for Japanese traditional music, for example, he sought to gain as much exposure to it as he could fit into his trip. He would later describe the experience of cultural immersion in Asia as refreshing and advised his friends to undertake a similar journey. But before positioning himself in world affairs, he would take he would look at the arts as a sandbox for his peace building agenda. Carnegie served on the boards of the Oratorio Society of New York and the New York Symphony Society, and he funded the construction of a quote music hall and quote that he served that would serve as a venue for both groups. Opening in 1881, the opulent facility would be known as Carnegie Music Hall, but Carnegie hinted at a larger social mission for the venue during um, the ceremony as which the course cornerstone was laid. Quote, it is built to stand for ages. And during these ages, it is probable that this hall will intertwine itself with the history of our country. All good causes may find here a platform." End quote. Not only would he support performances by international artists and music advocating peaceful relations, but when he convened delegates from around the world in 1907 for the National Arbitration and Peace, Con Peace Congress, Carnegie selected the hall as the event's primary venue. The stage was, quite literally, a platform for global debate and discussion. Only a few years after Carnegie Music Hall opened to the public, Carnegie established what would come to be known as the Carnegie International, an exhibition of international contemporary art presented at Carnegie Institute, a facility he established in Pittsburgh, uh, the hub of his steel industry. The exhibition and many of Carnegie's in um, the exhibition combined many of Carnegie's interests. He saw contemporary art, or the uh, quote, old masters of tomorrow, as a shrewd investment. Um, art loan for the exhibition could be purchased inexpensively and then appreciate in value, um, like a stock. This practice would become central to the institute's strategy for acquiring works and building the museum's collection. Carnegie took tremendous pride in the institution and the exhibition drew global attention to it. He also established the first foundation to fund and govern the institute. And this became a charitable business model upon which he would repeat and tweak. Carnegie's cultural engagement became his pathway into world affairs and the work of global understanding and peace building. When mounting fear of Japan's influence and naval strength led the US to annex the island of Hawaii in 1898, Carnegie advocated for decreased naval presence in the region. He also protested the annexation of the Philippines by the US under the terms of the Treaty of Paris that same year. Although consistent with anti or his anti-imperial agenda, these bold stances ran counter to Carnegie's business interests. Carnegie still was a key supplier of the steel used in the Navy's military vessels. A decreased naval presence would entail a decreased demand for Carnegie's steel. And he must have seen this contradiction when he retired in 1901 to focus exclusively on his philanthropy and mission of world peace. Later projects would include a 1903 contribution to the construction of a Temple of Peace at The Hague, which would house sessions of the Permanent Court of Arbitration and the establishment of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in 1910 to, as Carnegie put it, quote, hasten the abolition of international war, end quote. Like those of their successors, these global philanthropic efforts went without their detractors. Both Carnegie and Rockefeller were subject to contemporaneous criticism. Andrew Carnegie was acutely aware of what would appear to be hypocrisy. In a, in a letter posted in 1900 to a fellow peace advocate, William T. Stead, Carnegie stated, quote, there's nothing that robs a righteous cause of its strength more than a millionaire's money, end quote. Reverend William Jewett Tucker, of uh, the 19th or the ninth president of Dartmouth College saw fault in the argument for philanthropy that Carnegie had advocated um, 
in the gospel of wealth. Quote, within proper limits, the public is advantaged by the gifts of the rich, end quote. Tucker wrote, quote, but if the method becomes the accepted method to be expected and relied upon, the decline of the public self-respect has begun, end quote. Methodist Bishop Hugh Price Hughes, a vocal critic of Carnegie's philanthropy, more pointedly described Carnegie as, quote, an anti-Christian phenomenon, a social monstrosity, and a grave political peril, end quote. In seeking the charter for the Rockefeller Foundation, the senior Rockefeller was met with resistance from Theodore Roosevelt. Quote, no amount of charity in spending such fortunes could compensate in any way for the misconduct in acquiring them, uh, Roosevelt declared. Pushback also came from the denominational communities whose, Rocke who, whose work Rockefeller had generously supported, a contribution for the, for the American Board of Commissioners for the Foreign Missions, uh, the missionary arm of the Congressional Church, uh, stoked a heated debate within the church. In a public response, Minister Washington Gladden implored the church to decline gifts from, quote, person whose gains have made, have been, I'm sorry, quote, from person whose gains have been made by methods morally reprehensible or socially injurious, end quote. Criticism even appeared in Chinese language newspapers published in the US, specifically espousing a growing belief that by engaging with Carnegie, Rockefeller, and also JP Morgan, China was importing US plutocracy rather than democracy. Carnegie and the Rockefellers wove culture politics and um, and business together in their respective approaches to philanthropy. And it appears that much of this work springs from genuine curiosity and was inspired by people to people exchanges uh, in the creation of organizations and venues such as Carnegie Music Hall and, and um, Asia Society, culture and politics in, intermingle. For Carnegie, culture served as a platform to test his ideas and develop uh, concepts that he would scale in his later philanthropic efforts. But for the Rockefellers, cultural exchange was identified as a strategy after generations of iteration. In both cases, cultural immersion, primarily through travel, shaped Carnegie's and Rockefeller's philanthropic agenda. And in championing cultural organizations, exhibitions, and venues, they sought to replicate this understanding and build uh, cooperation. And I was going to conclude there, but since I have just a little bit more time, I do want to just share one little piece about Andrew Carnegie and his trip to Asia. And that is that there are many corroborating accounts as he traveled uh, through China of shopkeepers becoming frustrated with Carnegie as he would go, as he'd go through their stores and exhaustively try every single gong, um, one after the other to test their tone. And he eventually brought with him back to the US 10 gongs in total. That I would say represents a certain commitment that he had made and a passion that he had for the arts and culture. So thank you. Thank you and uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Nick, for uh, I, I think something that will provoke a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, comment and, um, uh, and it still resonates today with modern day philanthropy, uh, obviously, but maybe we can get into the uh, discussion. Uh, our next panelist is uh, 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 Dr. Roseanne uh, Sia, who's an assistant professor at the Institute for uh, Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia. Her paper, titled Performing Ambiguity, Asian American and Latina Nightclub Performers as Cultural Diplomats in the Early Cold War, uh, is based, I think, on her manuscript, Fantasy in Motion, a book manuscript that uh, um, uh, Fantasy in Motion, Performing Racial Imaginaries in the Early Cold War. So, Roseanne, all yours. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Meridian for inviting me here today and for organizing this event. And thank you to Dr. Curran for engaging with this talk and to my panelists and all of you here today as well. So today I would like to discuss the careers of two nightclub singers, Arita Vidauri and Florence Ahn, who I argue served as unofficial cultural diplomats in the early Cold War. 
One Mexican American and the other Korean American both earned a living from their art as they toured across the Americas to cities including San Francisco, New York City, San Antonio, Mexico City, Havana, and Panama in the 1940s to 1960s. My research explores how Latina women and Asian American women leveraged mid-century American globalism to take on roles as unofficial cultural diplomats within the unlikely space of the commercial nightclub. As Asian American and Latina women, they occupied in-between positions in the United States, approaching but never fully granted belonging to American national identity. In my work, I draw on oral histories and archival research to explore how they navigated this ambiguous position as they traveled on nightclub circuits across the Americas to gain social, cultural, and spatial mobility in the early Cold War. I argue that they crossed boundaries of genre and nation, moving from American show tunes to Mexican ranchera song or Cuban zarzuela, at times strategically promoting American national identity, while at other times slipping into Mexican or Cuban national identities. This unofficial cultural diplomacy complicates our understanding of American narratives of racial integration and globalism at mid-century. Asian American and Latina nightclub performers draw our attention to the complex desires that form an important, if often erased, component of Cold War cultural exchanges. Early Cold War nightclub circuits traced over roots of American military, economic, and tourist expansion across the Pacific and the Americas. On stage, the exoticism of race beckoned. Asian American and Latina women embodied racial and gender fantasies as they catered to American tourists, but also local elites and multi-ethnic audiences. As skilled entertainers, they crafted performances that worked with fantasies as they moved between representing America to representing Mexico or Cuba. Within the intimate space of the nightclub, they opened up opportunities to explore desire, including cross-racial desire, in non-normative ways. In doing so, they offer a more inclusive view of cultural exchange through U.S. engagements with the world that widened American racial, gender, and sexual norms. Scholars such as Christina Klein, Penny Von Eschen, Cindy Chang, Susie Wu, and Benjamin Hahn have argued that the United States sought to define itself as the racially democratic leader of an integrated world order in the early Cold War, disavowing the violence of U.S. expansion across the Pacific and Latin America. American culture, literature, film, TV, and state-sponsored cultural diplomacy played an important role in disseminating visions of American cross-cultural friendship and benevolence within the heightened Cold War context. These cultural imaginaries put a spotlight on people of color to promote an image of American racial democracy, both at home and abroad. Most famously, jazz ambassadors such as Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie were sent abroad by the US State Department with the stated aim of promoting American values of freedom and democracy. Significantly, who could stand in for America in these official cultural exchanges was a source of debate and anxiety for selection committees. African-American artists faced scrutiny for their political views. Queer artists like Alvin Ailey confronted regulation during their tours. And African-American women, such as dancer Catherine Dunham, were often viewed as too sexual and outright excluded. Meanwhile, Asian-American and Latinx performing artists had an ambiguous relationship to American national identity, inhabiting a space in between the American racial binary of black and white. In the early Cold War, American musicals like Flower Drum Song, the popularity of Latin music by singers like the De Castro Sisters, and TV variety so shows such as The Ed Sullivan Show featured a blossoming of images of Asia and Latin America. As Klein and Hahn have argued, these middle-brow cultural productions served a pedagogical function to teach white Americans the correct feelings of sympathy for a racial other in an effort to promote an image of a progressive and tolerant racially integrated America. This relied on what Han calls ethnic spectacles, in which Asian American and Latinx performers approached inclusion but remained marked by race. This also had gendered implications. To access the screen and stage, Asian American and Latina women had to embody quote unquote appealing racial and gender fantasies like the geisha, lotus blossom, Mexican senorita, or dancing Latina. In an American nation invested in the preservation of whiteness, American middlebrow cultural productions downplayed the threat of interracial sexuality, infantilizing and otherwise denying the marriageability of Asian American and Latina women. 
And yet desire plays an undeniable role within American cultural exchange. Cold War nightclubs open up a lens to explore desire and fantasy in this context. So let me turn now to discuss the extraordinary careers of Rita Vidauri and Florence Zahn. So Rita Vidauri was born and grew up on the west side of San Antonio, Texas, a racially segregated neighborhood that was home to a working class Mexican American and Mexican migrant population. As a young girl, Rita told me that she spent her summers living under a bridge in Alice, Texas, a small town southeast of San Antonio, where her father did seasonal work in the local oil refinery mill. Faced with severe racism in the United States, Rita turned to the world of Mexican song, learning by ear from Mexico City's XCW radio station. As a Mexican-American singer, from early on, Rita Vidauri faced accusations that she was a quote-unquote pocha, a derogatory term that in her words meant, quote, that you're not a Mexican and you're not American, end quote. Rita lived in what feminist theorist Gloria Anzaldúa has termed the open wound of the borderlands. Anzaldúa argues that to live in the borderlands is to experience a violent cutting of the self, forced into an either or, but occupying a both that cannot be acknowledged, a person who inhabits the borderlands is in a constant state of movement, never settled. Over the course of her nightclub career, Rita learned to use this in-between position to her advantage to represent both the United States and Mexico through performing racial and gender fantasies. When Rita moved to Mexico in 1944 to pursue a singing career, she discovered that she had to prove her Mexicanness. Although she could wear the national dress of the China Poblana, which you can see on the left in the slide, Rita recalled the, the MC pointing to her and saying, quote, we have this pocha tejana that sings. When one of the mariachi musicians discovered Rita did not know the Mexican national anthem, he said to her, quote, how can you know it? You're not Mexicana. You're not from here. And Rita told me, it hurt me so much because I love Mexico. I said, you're right, I'm not from here and I don't know it, but I'm here in Mexico when I could be making dollars over there. But you, if you cross the bridge and they let you come over there, you'll never come back to Mexico. So in this moment, Rita found no contradiction in claiming an identity as a true Mexicana through the privileges of her American citizenship. Rita learned to use the tight association between ranchera song and Mexican nationalism to appeal to Mexican audiences. She had to learn to sing ranchera authentically with a sentiment that evoked a Mexican sense of nostalgia for its rural past. Singing in her raspy voice about love and betrayal, at times wearing Mexican charro pants, which you can see on the right, Rita joined famous singers like Lucha Reyes and Lola Beltran in transgressing gender and sexual norms. By developing these gendered performances of ranchera song that spoke to Mexican experiences of dislocation at a time of rapid urbanization, Rita gained, gained acclaim in Mexico, including in Mexico City. Mexican critics now wrote that, quote, the collective soul of Mexico is identified in Rita Vidauri's art. When Rita returned to San Antonio, Texas during the early Cold War, she returned to a city marketing a Spanish fantasy past for its growing tourist industry. Rita discovered she could now stand in for Texas. The image of the Spanish senorita who swirled her colorful skirt displaced contemporary Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. It positioned Anglo-Americans as bringing a Spanish colonial past into the modern future. Frozen in time, this relegated the threat of cross-racial sexuality to the past. Rita became the poster girl for Jack's beer, and in the advertisement, her figure literally bursts through a, through a map of Texas as she now stands in figur figuratively for the state, wearing the Mexican China Poblana dress. Rita's racialized and gendered body, and by extension, Jack's beer, was now linked to a celebration of Texan modernity as a rising economic and technological power. Standing in for these different imaginaries of Texas, Rita discovered that she could also assert an American identity while traveling in the Panama Canal Zone. There, singing before an expat community of Pan American Airways employees at the Panama Hilton, Rita found she could leverage her in-between status. Although she was booked as a Mexican singer of Ranchera Song, when she discovered a demand for American song, she started rehearsing popular American jazz standards for the first time in her career. She strategically put together a show where she deliberately worked with desire, recognizing these desires had shifted as she traveled. She began opening the show wearing a little black dress, singing standards like on the sunny side of the street, my blue heaven, my personal possession. And then to close the show, Rita changed into a Chino Poblana to sing Mexican songs while accompanying herself on her guitar. 
For the expat community in Panama, she evoked an exotic cosmopolitanism through her ability to stand in for an image of the United States at the forefront of jet age glamour, adventuring abroad into exotic locales. Throughout her career, Rita as a Mexican American woman who inhabited an in-between position used racial and gendered performances to represent both Mexico and the United States. Her story points to the complicated American cultural exchanges that occurred in the early Cold War nightclub. She opened up a space for both Mexicans and Americans to explore a nostalgic desires and longings for a lost past as they turn towards a modern future. So let me turn to talk about Florence on now. Florence was born in Honolulu in 1919, the daughter of Korean migrants. After graduating, she left to study opera at Los Angeles City College. In 1939, she was awarded a fellowship to study voice at Juilliard Graduate School in New York City. But despite these achievements, Florence saw little possibility of a career in classical opera as a woman of Asian descent in the United States. She married a Korean student attending Harvard, and they settled down in San Francisco, California. But after she found herself a single mother with two young boys to support, she made the bold decision to move to New York City, where she found an agent and booked singing engagements, not in opera, but in nightclubs. When she arrived in New York City in 1948, Florence became immersed in what Christina Klein has termed Cold War Orientalism, the growth of American middlebrow entertainment about Asia, like the musicals and films Flower Drum Song, South Pacific, and A Many Splendored Thing. Asian-themed nightclub reviews that featured an Asian female body were all the rage. Daniel Said has identified the rise of what she calls the Asian slash American femme in Cold War TV. These figures stood in as stylish and beautiful symbols of inclusion, but their exotic racial difference marked them as perpetually citizens in the making. On the way towards national inclusion, they remained marked by race. Further, portrayed as beneficiaries of liberal democracy, their role, as Said argues, was to offer care and gratitude to the nation with their gendered and sexual gifts. Florence navigated these racial and gendered fantasies of Asian American women as she performed in New York City. Her classically trained voice represented the promises of American, the promises of American democracy to critics who often commented on her Juilliard school training but they also continually remarked on the exoticism of her racial and gendered body, which reduced her to at best a copy or a mimic, the quote, finest singer of her race, as one critic said. In December 1948, when Florence appeared on the Arthur Godfrey Talent Scouts TV and radio show, Godfrey framed her performance not in terms of her voice, but in terms of her Korean ethnicity, making a joke about her Korean dress to promote his Lipton tea sponsorship. The racial difference of her body undermined the reception of her performance. However, when Florence was invited to perform in Havana, Cuba in the early 1950s, and you can see her second to the, um, uh, to the left uh, from the right <laughs> in the photo, um, uh, in the front row, she encountered a very different reception. To her astonishment, she was elevated into stardom by a Cuban press that raved about her artistry offered a nightly radio show contract and regular bookings at high-class cabarets like the Tropicana and Sans Souci, she moved to Havana with her two sons. Walking with his mother down the Prado, her son Vincent told me that Cuban men would point to his mother, saying, Es la Florencia on, mira, mira, es Floren uh, Florence on, look, look, and then ask for her autograph. Cuban magazine Cartelis wrote, quote, this Chinese girl came, saw, and conquered. She came to Cuba like a shining star. In Havana's cabarets, Florence now found herself able to represent both the United States and Cuba. On the one hand, her classically trained voice evoked artistry, class education, and the sophistication of Euro-American modernity. On the other hand, the Cuban press exoticized Florence as La Dama China de la Cancion, the Chinese Lady of Song, Muñequita China, Little Chinese Doll, and Pollo Chino, as you can see here, Chinese Chick. Cuban cabaret culture catered to American desires for the exotic and the erotic by marketing their own histories of race and gender during the early Cold War. In Cuba, this vision centered on the national symbol of the mulata, a body who represented this movement towards whiteness and yet retained the quote unquote stain of blackness. However, due to Cuba's significant histories of Chinese migration, the figure of the mulata also included the influence of the Trans-Pacific. Florence could be folded into the nation by evoking the figure of the China Mulata, the product of interracial mixing with the Chinese in Cuba. 
And as you can see on the left here, the cover of the May 27th, 1956 Cuban magazine Cartelis depicts the figure of a China mulata foregrounded in full brilliant color, her voluptuous beauty overtaking the line drawings of the Chinese men in the background. She is shown transforming into the figure of the mulata, embodying a process of becoming, looking towards Cuba's future. In this context, Florence too could stake a claim to the heart and soul of Cuba. And the Cuban press was fascinated by her romantic life, expressing a desire that she would marry and settle down in Cuba. Florence played to these desires when she told a reporter, quote, I will marry in Cuba and I will not go away. In the 1950s, however, Florence was also part of a broader entry of Cold War American middle brow culture about Asia into Cuba. At the Tropicana, famous choreographer Rodney produced no less than four full-length Asian-themed reviews in the 1950s, reinterpretations of American orientalized productions like Tea House of the August Moon, renamed as Casa de Te, The King and I, called Lola y el Tre de Siam, and Flower Drum Song as the double shows Chinatown and En un Paraíso del Asia. At a time when Asia could be inflected by a tinge of American modernity, mixed Chinese Cuban vedettes such as Xenia Lopez and Emilia La China Via Mil also took to the cabaret stage. Within the extravagance of Cuban cabaret, elite Cubans and American tourists alike gazed at the vedettes striking diva performances that powerfully put their statuesque bodies on display, a celebration of cross-racial desire. For the Cuban press, Florence brought to mind a bewildering number of associations, which drew Cuba into a larger cosmopolitan world. A journalist in Pueblo wrote, quote, this is something serious to be in Havana and interviewing a lovely Chinese woman who was born in Honolulu, who likes the Spanish language and who loves Argentinian mate drink is like being at the center of the United Nations. Florence learned songs by the most Cuban of composers, Ernesto Lacona, including the aria from his Azuela, Maria La O, the quintessential song of the figure of the mulata. The Cuban press was fascinated by her ability to sing, quote, in English, French, and Spanish with absolute authority. Florence played up this linguistic virtuosity by singing songs like Sin Ti and Besame Mucho in both English and Spanish, sometimes rotating languages between the verses. As she toured to Havana, Florence turned her in-between status of American mimic into performances through which she represented both the United States and Cuba. Her story reveals the cultural exchanges that occurred within a Cuban cabaret culture responding to the desires generated by white American encounters with the exotic, including fantasies of Asia, which Cubans fused with their own racial and gendered imaginaries. <clears throat> Sitting between Black and white racialization in the United States, Asian American and Latino communities have historically had a fraught relationship with representing America. Official policies for cultural diplomacy have often led to regulation and exclusion in determining who gets to represent America. By shifting our view to unofficial cultural diplomacy, as I have done here with early Cold War nightclub performers, we gain a more complicated view of American cultural exchange showing how complication and cultural exchange are fused. Asian American and Latina nightclub performers show how the ability to represent the United States shifts historically and geographically. Nightclub performers leverage their in-between position by crafting performances that moved across national imaginaries as they sought social, cultural, and geographical mobility. Asian American and Latina nightclub performers also bring into focus the critical role of fantasy and desire in American cultural exchange. As they developed racial and gendered performances on the nightclub stage, they also opened up opportunities to explore desire, including non-normative desire, ranging from nostalgia for a fantasy past to cross-racial desire for an Asian American modernity. In this way, Asian American and Latina nightclub performers exceeded early Cold War narratives of American racial democracy and globalism. And in the ways that they began to decenter white normative America, they also presage our current moment as the nation makes efforts to recognize rather than turn away from issues like Black Lives Matter and queer and trans activism in the United States, a recognition that has required substantial and complicated relationship building across borders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Roseanne. Very interesting parallel to Nick's piece, I think, uh, uh, moving from the philanthropic uh, piece of representation to the artistic one and, and how those, uh, those uh, boundaries and imaginaries are, are indeed navigated. Uh, our uh, third uh, uh, panelist is uh, Madison Leeson, uh, who's coming to us from Istanbul. 
so a little different from British Columbia. Uh, and Madison is a historian, PhD candidate in cultural heritage management at Coach University. And her paper, uh, UNESCO UNDP Programming and the Iraqi Response, 1958 to 1979, uh, considers the Regional Training Center for Conservation of Cultural Property in Arab countries, administered by UNESCO uh, and funded by the UNDP, and uh, analyzes how Western claims to authority, but particularly within the field of archaeology and heritage management, were received by Iraqi and Arab heritage specialists during the period of rising Arab nationalism. Madison? Thank you so much, Dr. Kieran, for the introduction. And thank you again to the other panelists for your presentations and to the conference organizers for including me on this panel. Okay. Um, today, I will be presenting an abridged version of my research on UNESCO UNDP programming in Iraq, discussing how it was negotiated between the stakeholders involved. On January 1st, 1973, UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, signed a contract between the General Directorate of Antiquities in Iraq and the University of Baghdad to establish the Regional Training Center for Conservation of Cultural Property in Arab Countries. The objectives of the center were to train conservationists and museum specialists in the Arab world on techniques of preservation, to provide guidance to Arab member states, assist in the preparation of antiquities protection legislation, and run practical workshops on conservation. The center was modeled closely after a similar institution in Rome, the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, later referred to as ICROM, also as the Rome Center. Founded in 1959, the Rome Center was UNESCO's pioneer training center uh, for conservation of cultural property. The lessons they learned from Rome, however, would not be as relevant to the new center in Baghdad. Archival material from UNESCO reveals initial concerns about funding from the United Nations Development Program, followed by a sort of disillusionment with the, con with the competence of Iraqi specialists. This led to the disenfranchisement of local stakeholders with consequences for the administra administration of the center. These trends, along with UNESCO's increasing tendency to accept credit for the center's successes and shift the blame for its weaknesses, negatively affected the organization's relationship, UNESCO's relationship with local specialists and intelligentsia. This research is based on previously unpublished archival material of UNESCO's operations in Iraq and contributes to our understanding of the organization's programming in the Middle East. By the early 1970s, the UNDP had already financed a litany of development projects in dozens of countries around the world. The initial UNDP contribution for UNESCO's training center in Baghdad was $185,600 to be allocated $65,600 in the first year, and then $40,000 annually for 1974, 75, and 76. This budget underwent multiple rounds of revisions and was subject to internal pushback from both UNDP and UNESCO officers. Um, despite an internal memo from 1973 reported an extreme shortage of UNDP funds, particularly at the regional level. Despite this extreme shortage of funds, the center was UNESCO's main project for Iraq during this period, dominating their archives of the 1970s, which is what I will focus on in this presentation and demonstrating its importance to the interests of the United Nations. To promote the first course, UNESCO contacted these Arab states of the Middle East and North Africa to ask whether they intended to send specialists for training. Recipient countries were informed that there was no cost for the program as it was instituted under United Nations technical assistance, but that the trainees countries of origin must pay for their transportation to and from Baghdad. In an internal note, UNESCO established the priority for applicants. Jordanian applicants were the most desirable, followed by trainees from Yemen, Sudan, Algeria, and Morocco. However, following the application period, few of these priority countries had responded, so UNESCO accepted all applicants and provided fellowships for two trainees from Kuwait 
and one each from Syria, Sudan, Algeria, and Libya. As early as 1973, we see the interest of the Rome Center, whose assistant director, Giorgio Taraka, uh, visited Baghdad later that year. Dr. Abdel Naji, the director of the center in Baghdad, wrote to Taraka in anticipation of his visit. He wrote, quote, we would like to offer our far from perfect services in arranging the schedule of your visits and meetings throughout your stay in Baghdad. We hope it will be fruitful and play an active role in preserving mankind's heritage, end quote. The Rome Center, established and successful, served as a model for the Baghdad Center, and communications between the two directors convey a sort of mentor-mentee relationship. The Middle East and North Africa were seen by UNESCO as a strategic area that might benefit from a training center in Baghdad, the same way Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa had from similar training centers in Mexico and Nigeria. The 1970s saw the rapid growth of a technologically inclined intelligentsia in Iraq, many of whom were seeking training for their positions in the country's public sector. This class of post-secondary educated specialists was both attracted to and unfortunately neglected by the Baghdad Center. Certain qualifications were expected of applicants to the center's training program. Proficiency in English, a post-secondary degree, experience in the field, and a government position. At the same time, as you will see, the center failed to provide such amenities to the students as livable stipends, temperature appropriate clothing, adequate housing, and practical workshops. The first training course, like the four that followed it, was held in Arabic, French, or English, depending mainly on the language competencies of the instructors. The students of the first course are listed here in order of academic performance, strongest first. I'd just like to point out Hisham Hilmi. He will reappear later. Um, only the first three students scored at a high level, and their lecturer wrote that they should be recommended for further training. The remaining trainees were, for the most part, weak, poor, or even seemed to have no knowledge whatsoever of English. Although the course was conducted in Iraq for Arab trainees with the majority of classes in Arabic, the student's competence in English was still considered a key indicator of their success in the program. It's worth stressing here that European or North American consultants did not feel the same pressure to learn Arabic. Although Arabic was adopted as an official language of the UN and UNESCO in 1973, this seems to have been largely symbolic. UNESCO still required the center's reports be submitted in English or French, and I did not find any Arabic correspondence in the archives. Following the first course, the trainees were asked to write brief reports on their experience and provide recommendations on how future programs could be improved. Although every trainee thanked UNESCO for the opportunity and reflected on how the training will benefit them in their work, there was a wide range of complaints and criticisms about virtually every aspect of the course. The trainees lamented that the class schedule and site visits were disorganized, lecturing experts were regularly late, the housing was far from the center and there was inadequate transportation, the library was ill-equipped for their studies, and the course content was too theoretical with not enough practical experience practical exercises. They also reached out to UNDP directly to ask for a clothing allowance, as the weather was unpredictable and one student fell ill as a result of being unprepared. The center's director, Naji, quickly contacted UNDP to report that the trainee's request was made without his permission, asking UNDP to ignore it. Generally, the center appears to have been pulled in separate directions, torn between its obligations to UNESCO UNDP on the one hand and the trainees on the other. Unfortunately, despite the experience and success of trainees like Hisham Hilmi and Abdul Rahman Muhammad Ali, the administration often took the side of their financiers. Despite these many grievances, the reports always concluded on a positive note. Here's an excerpt from the report of Awad Abdullah al jaidi the director of antiquities and museums in South Yemen. He wrote, I am actually putting whatever grasped at the center of Baghdad into practice, and I am in a good position to do and carry out great projects so as to keep the department of our museums in the standard of the advanced world. al Jaidi's reference to the advanced world complemented the rhetoric of UNESCO officials, whose internal letters often referred to developed or scientifically advanced Europe in contrast to the Middle East and North Africa, 
which in their eyes were in need of expert assistance and training centers. Thus, the trainees reports tell us not only of the poor conditions of the center, but also of their tolerance for these, con these conditions with the expectation of learning the standards of the advanced world. The third course focused again on training in conservation and preservation of cultural property. Um, participants of the course are shown on the slide, and the first four received UNESCO fellowships to fund their tra travel to Baghdad. At the time of the course's start, which was later postponed to November 1st, Huda Issa was 28 years old with a BA in architecture from the Damascus from the Damascus University Faculty of Arts. She wrote in her application that she would be, quote, responsible for the restoration of old Damascus, a project in which she hoped to use the training gained from the course. Unfortunately, Issa later withdrew from the course, quote, for her own personal reasons. But an internal report reveals the center was not aware about her participation and arrival date to be able to provide a suitable lodging for her. Thus, she was forced to lodge at hotels, costing her 10 Iraqi dinar, and it seems that this was the main reason behind her decision to leave the course, end quote. Um, as a side note, 10 Iraqi dinar in 1975 would have been about um, 34 American dollars. It is both remarkable and disappointing that such a basic concern as suitable lodging was the difference between Issa receiving the training she needed to restore old Damascus and her unceremoniously withdrawing from the program. In addition to the six months training program, there was also to be a short refresher course in the fall of 1975. Both, however, were criticized by trainees for the same issues that had stricken previous seasons. The course dates were changed multiple times, complicating the arrival dates of the students. The center struggled to find convenient accommodation. UNESCO provided only four fellowships when they had promised 10. Lectures often missed important subjects, such as conservation of metal. And there were continuous complaints from the trainees about the stipends they received from UNESCO, the funding being inadequate and regularly arriving late. In fact, all of the trainees signed a petition to request a higher monthly allowance from UNESCO, owing partly to the fact that their salaries in their home countries had the amount of the stipend deducted. In response to the various complaints, one senior program officer at UNESCO wrote a largely defensive letter that shifted blame for everything away from the organization. The refresher course overlapped with Ramadan, but on the religious festivities, this was beyond our control. Although the coursework may have been too theoretical, I cannot see how we could have done anything from here. And on the trainees' late arrivals in Baghdad, the Egyptian trainees' ministry would not release him, and the Algerian delegation never gave us the personal address of their candidate. Going forward, it is not uncommon to see UNESCO accepting credit for the successes of the center while shifting blame for its faults onto the Iraqi government and the Arab member states. Reports from trainees, lecturers, and UNESCO consultants criticized not only the physical building and amenities of the center, but also its location in Baghdad and the methodological weaknesses of its host country. In 1977, consultant Saeed Zulfikar reported, it would seem that the location of the center in Iraq is not the best choice insofar as the practical examples which the trainees have before their eyes in the country are somewhat unhappy and certainly do not warrant their initiation elsewhere. The Iraqi Department of Antiquities is not so much intent on conserving and restoring as in renovating and indeed in reconstructing. I visited several archeological sites which were being totally reconstructed following the imagination of present day architects. I witnessed to my great dismay and horror uh, that the world famous mosques of Hussein and Ali in Karbala and Najaf and the mosque in Kufa had been totally renovated. The beautiful wooden mosaic ceilings and pillars had been removed and replaced by glass, crystal and concrete. As there is no shortage of funds, referring to Iraq's oil wealth, it is feared that the disfiguration of Iraq's architectural past will proceed with a quickening pace and this is hardly the example we should wish to see the trainees follow when they return home. Thank you for your patience while I read that whole excerpt. At this point, however, UNESCO and UNDP had few available options for reform. Excessive intervention would undermine the provisions of the General Conference of UNESCO and the Executive Board, which deplored imperialism, aggression, and racial discrimination. 
provisions which Iraq's Ba'athist government had thanked UNESCO Director General Amadou Matarambao for respecting. For the 1975-76 training course, lecturers included one Indian, one Frenchman, one Turk, one Italian, and seven Iraqis. We've seen that by this point, the administration of UNESCO is aware of the center's problems, made clear by the trainees' reports, and have an extremely critical view of Iraqi conservationists. Why then would UNESCO suddenly recruit so many Iraqis to lecture while believing so strongly that they're ill-equipped for the task? One possible explanation is that um, as Iraqi lecturers were not eligible for any payment from UNESCO, UNESCO was willing to sacrifice quality of education in their eyes if it meant they could unload some financial burden onto the Iraqi government. By the end of 1977, the center had trained more than 40 students from um, 14 Arab countries and had scheduled the fourth training course. In addition, a short refresher course was held from September 1st until November 30th the same year. There's no document confirming the final program register, but applicants for the course are shown on screen. Habib and Lokma, the first female candidates since Huda Issa in 1975, both confirmed their participation, but there is no record of them continuing in the course or reporting on their experiences. Issa, as mentioned, was overlooked by the center in 1975 and from having to shoulder the costs of her own accommodation was forced to leave Iraq and return to Damascus. However, this is not the only instance in which we see the center neglect a female participant. In 1978, the center contacted ICROM's Professor Lena Wikström to lecture in an upcoming training course in Baghdad. However, a number of complaints were made about her by Hisham Hilmi, a trainee of the first course and a prior student of Wikström's, who had since become an assistant at the center. After investigating the case, ICROM's director, Bernard Fildin, determined that the complaints were due to, quote, a personal grudge and did not exist at a political level as Wikström had reported Helmi for cheating on the final exam of her previous course. Wikström was confirmed as a lecturer and began to plan her trip to Baghdad. The center called her to inform her that she was still welcome, um, that her flight and hotel were booked, and that she would be met at the airport on arrival. Later that same day, an unidentified man phoned from the Baghdad center saying that Wikström must not go because the ministry did not approve of her. Ikram's Turaka immediately called Naji at the center to resolve the issue, but Hilmi answered the phone. He told Turaka that Ikram did not confirm Vikstrom's arrival in time, so the center had already booked a professor from Baghdad University. It seems that Hilmi made that phone call to Vikstrom to convince her not to come to the center and then double booked a second lecturer so he could justify canceling her trip. Importantly, this case study also exposes the critical role of Ikram in the center's operations. In 1979, ICROM received a contract with UNESCO for $17,400. Based on the timing of this contract, the payment was presumably intended as a contribution for the fifth training course. With this contract, ICROM appears to have usurped UNDP's role for the center. Did Naji create such a strong relationship with Taraka and Fildin in Rome that he was able to orchestrate an agreement with UNESCO that would cut out UNDP and assure assistance from a stakeholder more closely related to the center's aims? This would have also assuaged UNESCO's concerns about the dire financial situation in which UNDP had found itself earlier. Later documents refer to UNESCO ICROM as one unit and omit mention of UNDP entirely. Recall from the beginning of my presentation that UNDP contributions were only scheduled until 1976. Is 1979 where we see the center pull away from the rule of UNDP and assume greater financial autonomy? The UNESCO archives on the Baghdad Center continue until 1982, although it appears the center continued operations, at least in part, until 1986. Unfortunately, later archives are extremely sparse. As I hope I've demonstrated, UNESCO's training center in Baghdad ultimately fell short in a number of ways. UNESCO's internationalist vision for the center was undermined by a failure to engage meaningfully with Iraqi and Arab specialists. The top-down strategy of UNESCO's training center, which sought to establish standards for heritage management and conservation in Iraq, was also disconnected from established Iraqi institutions, limiting, limiting its impact in the country. Additionally, UNESCO's aversion to local conservationism and skepticism of Iraqi competence led to the disenfranchising of many Iraqi stakeholders 
and the perpetuation of an asymmetrical relationship between the West and the Middle East. This research offers a small contribution to our understanding of It looks like we've lost Madison for the, uh, for, the for the moment. So um, unless we can get her back, um, maybe I could. Uh, maybe we can uh, start. It's very interesting uh, discussion. I'm trying to follow Madison quite closely because uh, we ourselves at the Smithsonian, along with other partners, are involved in a conservation training center in Erbil <laughs> over the last nine years, and uh, uh, continue to work with our Iraqi colleagues closely. So uh, maybe I can start out with a, uh, a question for uh, Roseanne and, and, and Nick, and if Madison comes back in, which it seems like in both your presentation, Nick, you're talking about philanthropists outside the, the realm of the State Department or official US government policy. Sometimes they do stuff that might accord. Sometimes they do stuff because they want to on their own. They're, 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 they're using their, their private resources. They have money. And, 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 and Roseanne, I mean, you have uh, uh, two performers, uh, Rita Vidari and Florence Ahn, who were also outside the bounds of the State Department, outside of the U.S. government, kind of doing their own thing, uh, having their own cultural diplomacy unofficially, un uh, untethered from the government. So how do you, how, how, where do you put that? Where do you put that relationship between the kind of private, artistic in Roseanne's case, uh, philanthropic in Nick's case, where do you put that kind of idea of cultural diplomacy outside of diplomatic bounds, <laughs> official diplomatic bounds anyway? You wanna go first, Roseanne? Sure, I can go first. So I think, um... For me, it's been important to sort of flip our view of cultural diplomacy and to think about what we miss if we take only a top-down approach. And so for me, um, because I also am you know, quite invested in cultural exchange, I myself have participated in cultural exchange, I quite believe in, in funding cultural exchange. Um, um, but I, I think that it's important for us to look in sort of unlikely places um, that perhaps fall out of institutional structures, nightclub culture, street culture, um, to look where we might not expect to find American cultural exchange um, and to people who don't clearly represent America and to try to expand and be more inclusive in our view of what cultural diplomacy can be. Nick? Yeah, I mean, I'm of the persuasion that we're in, we're in a place within the kind of US context in which cultural diplomacy can be conducted through many, many informal channels. And we have things like film tele um, and television and things that happen in the commercial space that are hugely advantageous in what they present. Um, and I think we had an example of the um, kind of jazz diplomacy initiatives earlier, where they present this kind of American image of democracy as a piece of our cultural exchange puzzle. So what comes across is that element rather than kind of any other sort of unified message or piece. And that's, it's a huge advantage to be in a place where that is the thing that you are trying to get across rather than some kind of, um, as was mentioned, didactic top-down approach. So it's interesting with uh, uh, Madison, we're sorry we lost you at the end uh, of your presentation, but I thought it was very informative. And I had commented that uh, because I've been involved with uh, the uh, conservation uh, center in Erbil in Iraq in these days, <laughs> we're involved in that, you know, in a multinational uh, and uh, Iraqi uh, uh, training thing, uh, training program. But uh, your example is a little different because with with Roseanne and Nick, you're dealing with Americans who are, you know, kind of doing their own thing as they're they're allowed to do and making their own. Uh, cultural diplomacy, as it were, outside of official ranks. But your case shows how even within official ranks, <laughs> here's a very formal program between the government, you know, the UNDP, UN agencies, and so on. And yet there's still room for this expression, maybe using people's technical expertise, 
uh, maybe people's expectations to be treated as professionals. It also kind of runs uh, runs up against official governmental agreements and official governmental exchange. How, where, where do you put that uh, uh, in terms of that 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 ability of agency, I guess, of people who are involved in such programs to kind of foster their own perspectives? Well, UNESCO, um, I think we all do kind of have this idea that international or intergovernmental agencies are more capable of a neutral approach than we are. But these organizations, UNESCO included, they are made up of people and people have insurmountable um, biases. Um, this is, I think that it's interesting and constructive to realize this and approach um, historical studies with this framework. Um, UNESCO has an interesting brief, if I could, case study from the Iran-Iraq War. In 1984, they published um, an organization-wide memo that said the body of water in between Iran and a certain number of states to the West should be called the Persian Gulf, unless you're in correspondence with a country that uses an alternate term. Um, and then in 1985, the next year, some UNESCO mission consultants went to Iraq and submitted a report where they referred to it as the Persian Gulf, and Iraq preferred Arabian Gulf. And the UNESCO delegate from Iraq took this opportunity to accuse UNESCO of having an anti-Iraq bias, saying this is why you're trying to implement um, the Hague Convention, because this was the main issue implementing the Hague Convention. Uh, during the iran Iraq war. And so even little things like one word, Arabian versus Persian Gulf, they have huge consequences. And these biases aren't absent, but for international organizations like UNESCO, the consequences are much larger. larger. Mm -hmm. So all of you in your cases deal with the notion of the imaginary, of the, the kind of construction Either it's a construction of, uh, you know, America's identity in the world, or it's a construction of ethnicity and gender. It's a construction of uh, um, uh, expertise. Madison, I was taken by your, you know, the 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 notion, you know, this 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 imaginary, like, what would the end goal of conservation be? What does it look like? You know, is it a restoration? It is. Is it a reimagination? Uh, of identity. So I guess the question is, as you've approached this, how do you deal with that? Uh, you know, because, you know, one person's imaginary is another person's vision. How do we separate what, <laughs> you know, kind of, uh, how, how do you deal with that epistemologically or empirically in your work historically in identifying vision and imagination? That's pretty complicated, isn't it, Roseanne? Absolutely. And I think that's one of the challenges of the work that I'm doing. Um, but I think it's also one of the exciting parts of when we think about cultural exchange that we really can't think of it in simply a unilinear direction, right? That you, we simply are imparting something to the rest of the world in a sort of donation way. We can't think of, um, um, we also can't see it as um, something that's predictable, right? Culture is always unpredictable. And so when we look at the ways in which these imaginaries are being constructed in very situational ways, um, dependent on geography, dependent on his, um, on his uh, historical time period, um, we can see that, right? And if we take that seriously, we take those complications seriously, then we gain a much more um, complicated view of the possibilities of cultural exchange um, in which we can see it as a true dialogue, um, a true conversation um, where we see, say, American culture being folded into Cuban culture, being folded into Mexican culture in these um, original and creative ways. And I think that's important for us to um, fully uh, take seriously the local sites that we are studying and to um, see the the unexpected ways in which um, American culture gets um, brought into these local situations. Yeah, I mean, if we go to, uh, you know, Glenn Davies, you know, keynote where, you know, 
what what was that exhibit imagining? It was an imagining, a, you know, a, a, you know, a Thailand and America and a relationship between them, and then you know, effectuating a, effectuating that vision. Nick with with Carnegie and Rockefeller. I mean, they had enormous wealth and power to affect and impose their own visions on uh, uh, on international relations and exchange, and the power to affect it, the money to affect it. They found themselves sometimes at odds with the government and sometimes conforming to their own business interests, as you say, accused of hypocrisy in some cases. So how do you how do you judge those individuals uh, and the institutions they created vis-a-vis -vis the nation state, uh, America? <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, that's the fundamental question. Does it do more harm than good in some capacity? And also this question of whether or not, um, right, whether they should be taking on the role of the State Department as private actors and whether they should be crafting the image of America. Um, that is one for, you know, not for me to determine, but I'd say for the public to determine in some capacity, but it's also... Uh, you know, they pose a sort of interesting challenge to uh, the State Department and to the practice of diplomacy um, insofar as that they are approaching it not from that kind of pure government um, neutral stance, but instead they're taking it on with the rich subjectivity of being a person and a human that is interested in person to person connection. And they're really looking at that in an amazing way, right? Each of these philanthropists was, you know, they aren't necessarily inspired by a large kind of set of, you know, what we imagine is our kind of PowerPoint bullet talking points about human connection. They're instead looking and mining their own personal experiences, being on the ground connecting with individuals, right? Person to person connection that they then want to transform in, you know, they want to in this business fashion scale, right? They want to scale that and they see the arts and they see cultural diplomacy as the best way to scale that person-to-person -person interaction. Well, interesting. The uh, Madison with 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 the you know dealing with the uh, the uh, training program and you know kind of ICROM and UNESCO and UDNP, you're dealing with the notion kind of like this. So is there an in you know the, the setting up of an international standard you know, way of doing things, an international kind of objectivist vision that indeed your whole, the whole program is questioned by the participation of the various Arab country participants in that program. So where do we place those international standards for diplomacy in the context of what we see as, you know, construed imaginaries of nationhood, of ethnicity, of gender, and so on? Unfortunately, I think that um, the standards are closely tied up with these imaginative nationhoods. Um, UNESCO has and had other regional training centers. Um, the one in Nigeria I would like to talk about very quickly. Um, it's the Regional Center for the Conservation of Cultural Property for countries south of the Sahara. Um, and so for this center, region has been defined geographically, south of the Sahara. But for the Baghdad center, region has been determined along ethnic lines. It is the center for Arab countries. And so if you're from a country, an African country north of the Sahara, you go to the Arab center. If you are in a country south of the Sahara, you go to Nigeria. The Nigerian center their courses were pretty similar, but with more emphasis on ethnography, which I'm doing further research now, but I believe this reflected um, the common, what Brody and others have written on, that Europeans conceive of their own cultural objects as art. Um, the cultural objects of the Middle East are antiquities and the cultural objects of Africa are artifacts. Mm -hmm. I believe that this is reflected in the decision to um, have so much focus on ethnography in this course in the, the Nigeria Center. And so not to call the certainty of everything into question, but I think that these standards are just as much up for criticism as um, the organization trying to implement them. 
Interesting. Yeah, no, it's a great case. I love your, you know, the classification of objects. It's, uh, it really uh, uh, resonates. So there are a few questions from uh, audience members to directed to a particular panelist. So a question for Dr. Sia. In your opinion, do you think women of color performing in nightclubs during the Cold War did more uh, good um, uh, in terms of unconventional cultural exchange or harm perpetuating fetishization of Latinx and Asian American women? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I did a lot of oral history work for my project. Um, so I actually met with these women who are in their 80s and their 90s and chatted with them. And so having had that experience, I think it's very difficult for me to say that I see them as doing harm because I see them as, as trying to navigate their lives, right? They're mm -hmm. trying to be performers, very talented performers, sometimes highly, highly trained, um, who didn't have avenues to go forward except for a nightclub, right? Um, and so in that way, they took what was possible. They worked with um, the types of uh, tropes that they had to work with in order to gain some kind of visibility on a stage. But once they were on the stage, then they could open up possibilities. Then they had some level of control. And one thing that happened in so many of my interviews was that they did the same to me. You know, they broke into song, they got up, they tried to show me a move. And so for them, performance was the way in which they challenged those tropes. Um, and so I see them as, you know, yes, they were complicit in some way in um, perpetuating this fetishization, but they had to be in order to gain a stage and in order to also um, put out alternative imaginaries that I think we should take seriously and are important um, as we look um, and think today about how we can continue to open up and, you know, expand possibilities when it comes to race, gender, and sexuality. It's intriguing because, you know, in, in doing the oral histories and interviewing and having these interactions, I guess the question is, you know, to, to what extent was this kind of intuitive and performative as they did this? What kind of, what, was there a lot of self-reflection and strategy going into that? You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, for example, um, with, with, Native American, you know, Western shows and stuff in the United States, you know, in the late 1800s, you know, you had a lot of reflection about, you know, how do I perform being Indian? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how do I how do I do this and how do I convey certain things and a lot of strategizing. And of course, you know, th th this is done in a lot of places, you know, around the world. So to, how, how much how much reflection and strategy went into those constructions? I would say that it wasn't something that they would tell me verbally. But yeah. it was something that was there in their performances. Yeah. So I can give an example. There's a well-known uh, dancer, a nightclub dancer called Dorothy Toy. Um, she traveled um, across the US into um, Brazil, into Europe, um, all over. And she crafted a performance where she would start with um, uh, she called it a, a Chinese robe on, sometimes a kind of orientalized headdress. Um, and then she would, throughout the show, sort of strip that off, um, go into something um, progressively more um, uh, jazzy, um, and then into a kind of um, really her own style that pushed boundaries of genre. Um, and so she was kind of walking the audience away from the orientalized trope into uh -huh. what she wanted them to see. So I think there are many examples of that. That's one of the clearest ones, but where there is a self-consciousness about the kinds of expectations that the audiences were bringing uh, when they stepped onto stage and developing performance strategies in order to um, confront those and to move away from them. Good. Um... I had a question for Madison. You discuss nicely the history of UNESCO and UNDP, and it's good to be reminded of that. Are you involved in any current work involving Iraqi partners, and is that work focused on material culture or intangible heritage? Um, I am actually uh, currently engaged in one project uh, with the Nahrain Network in Iraq, um, and it actually focuses on both tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Um, we are uh, studying the historic buildings of certain cities in Iraq and then discussing my Iraqi colleague in Iraq, of course, is meeting with local community members to hear their stories of the neighborhood and the building to attach these lived experiences 
to the physical marker in the community. Um, yes, I. Yes, so I don't want to reveal too much. Um, yeah. <laughs> it is hopefully forthcoming this year. So. Okay. Well, good. Well, we we wish you luck again. I'm you know I'm involved the. Uh, uh, the Smithsonian has been working with uh, the um, uh, State Board of Antiquities and Heritage in Iraq for, for many years now, and uh, we're involved in uh, projects uh, with uh, SBAH and the Nineveh Protectorate in uh, restoring the site at Nimrud. And some of the questions you raise about, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, the Baghdad Center and international standards come up all the time and then of course we're working with the um, uh, SBH and the Mosul Museum staff in mm -hmm. uh, as well as with the Louvre and the World Monuments Fund and the Olive Foundation on the uh, restoration of the museum at Mosul uh, that ISIS you know severely damaged and, and, and brought that up and again with the coalition of sponsors, but some of the same issues, you know, pertain. I mean, it's those kind of discussions about what you're envisioning, what was what was at work in that envisioning of that architecture. Do you have something that's imposed, you know, by kind of Western governments that may be paying for it or international forces that may be paying for it? And what are those sensibilities of, you know, local community, local experts and so on. So it's uh, some of the stuff does not go away. <laughs> it doesn't doesn't go away. So Nick, I had a question for you because it seems to me when I think about, you know, like the philanthropists of that era and you think about people like Henry Ford as well and the creation of the Ford Foundation. And then I, I kind of fast forward to, 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 to Henry Ford and business practices and ideas about you know, the, the, the construction of national identity, Ford, Henry Ford had a particular idea of, you know, how to kind of, well, it was the melting pot, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Ford saw different people from different parts of the world coming to America and being made into working worker, wor American workers. And now you have somebody like Darren Walker, one, ru one running that foundation. And it, it seems a far stretch. So what do, what do, what are these, um, it seems like sometimes these institutions that may be created out of a certain impulse in one time end up changing over time or evolving over time. And yet, I, I guess, don't present day foundation leaders and staff feel some duty or have some fiduciary obligation to the visions of their founders? Yeah, and I think that's certainly a good question of how um, Henry Ford would see Darren Walker. Um, that would be a conversation I, I could only imagine. Um, <laughs> but yes, I will say that the leaders of these of foundations that are created by philanthropists do struggle with the legacies, right? The foundations are always created by imperfect people. Um, and they're always created with a specific vision and that's, and the kind of business models um, and the governing principles of foundations are often tied very closely to a family's values, which may or may not age particularly well. Um, I think what's critical is having a robust interrogation of those principles, figuring out what the really fundamental core values are, but also leaving the space to navigate, um, to, to kind of navigate with those. And I think we lost Dr. Kern. Oh, there you are. Um, and the space to navigate the, the foundation's roles through values um, and that is an ongoing conversation that's just something that the that the boards of these foundations are weighing out and for which we don't necessarily have a set of best practices yet this is all still relatively you know in the grand scheme of things new money so I, I guess when I'm you know, thinking about it, I mean, the world is pretty complex now and, you know, the, the, the um, you know, any government administration, I mean, we've just had, you know, pretty dramatic change in administrative views of the U.S. role in the world and, uh, and even cultural diplomacy, whether there should be some or not or how, how it should be funded and so on. Uh, we've had attempts over uh, different administrations to curtail uh, 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 cultural diplomacy 
And we've had other administrations that have created, you know, an assistant secretary or undersecretary in the State Department for cultural diplomacy or public diplomacy. So, you know, I, I guess the question is, how do we in, 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 in the U.S., because if, if we if all if all our cultural diplomacy was conducted by the government, right, you'd have the government decreeing like this is how we're going to do it. But how do we then square the fact that, you know, the country is free, I, you know, still, where you have artists, Roseanne, who can say their piece, who can get a visa and go to wherever they want to go and, and perform and be unofficial cultural diplomats in their own way, where foundations, Nick, can have a program that actually is pretty different than a government administration, or Madison, where you have experts you know, professors like you all or uh, other intellectuals or journalists that are not fettered by government regulations about what they say about relationships between the United States. So how do we square kind of, you know, a, a strategic, a national view of cultural diplomacy and the fact that we have freedom in various sectors for people to say and do whatever the heck they want? <laughs> And I suppose the counter counter question to that is why do we have to square it? Yeah, well, we don't. I mean, that's the question. <laughs> we, you know, we we, we don't. But the, but th then if you if you take that, Nick, doesn't it? I mean, we've all been, you know, people. I mean, right now, Madison is working overseas. You know, don't we all get when we're in other nations? Um, you know, people say, well, why do you Americans support that? And then you know, we'll all say, well, we don't. I don't support that. That's my government. <laughs> Right. And then people say, but yes, but you elected your government. <laughs> so so, you know, I, I, I'm not saying it has to be. Screwed. I'm just saying it's a complication. And how what are the what are the various ways that that gets processed or or not? I like that it affords us all plausible deniability. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. But I mean, Roseanne, people have confronted issues of artistic and freedom. In fact, my again, my father-in-law mentioned at the beginning was a cultural affairs officer in Africa, really, while national movements were going on. He got PNG from one country because he brought Buddy Guy and Junior Wells. And uh, the, the government didn't quite like that. <laughs> And, and issues of, uh, as you say, you know, the U.S. projected, did all sorts of programs in jazz and try to project, I think, in the faces of, you know, issues of criticism of a, you know, kind of multiracial, uh, uh, multi-ethnic America, and then got criticism for not having certain artists go on the road and represent America. I mean, don't artists rebel about saying, well, how come I can't be included in representing my country abroad? Right. I, I, I do wonder, um, you know, I just don't see culture as being something we can use in such a transactional way. And I don't think that we can actually control culture. Um, and of course, we see state policies attempting to do so. Um, but when they are so-called successful, are they really successful for the reasons that we think they are successful, right? There are so many other um, types of exchanges that are happening in the moment of um, artists going out, as, as I look at, for example. Um, and so for me, I, I do see it as a, as a good thing to, um, to, as I think Nick was also saying, you know, to see more alternative imaginaries, multiple imaginaries out there um, to let the, you know, not to try to control what we present as America, but rather to allow there to be some openness about that. So how about in reverse? And Madison, this is a question for you. So how about in reverse? That is, so if, if we see American cultural representation is very broad, diverse, free, you know, vital, robust, a lot of moving parts, somewhat ambiguous contradictions and whatever, then uh, do we then criticize other countries in their representation either to us or to other people in the world? That is when we criticize another government for saying, hey, you guys should do what we do as Americans and allow for this kind of freedom 
Do we regard that as a kind of neo-colonialist American imposition on the world by saying you should allow more private interests to represent your culture? You should allow more dissident artists to represent your culture. How does that play, Madison? Is that the imposition of a, an American standard on other people that maybe they wouldn't quite like? Well, I would agree that I think given America's, um, especially recent history, maybe they should steer clear of any imposition. Um, and I think one of the problems of UNESCO's center, which sometimes America is guilty of as well, is they start with this, what should we do? What should we, what do we want? How are we gonna get it? What do we have? But what you should really be thinking, in my opinion, is um, from the other side. It's not what are you going to get from this relationship, as Dr. Sia said. It's how are we going to collaborate? How can we together be greater than the sum of our parts? How can we work towards noble, noble goals together? What are you interested in? What assets do you have? Things like this, not just what do I want and how am I going to get it? Yeah. Well, it, it's certainly an interesting and complicated uh, issue that we have to deal with. My expectation is that we'll continue to mull on it. I think the fact that you all doing the analyses you're doing us help us chart the future of how we can effectively achieve a kind of cultural uh, exchange, cultural diplomatic uh, um, uh, world in, 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 a, in a kind of broad in a very broad way. So I thank you all for your participation, for provocative uh, talks and, and papers, and uh, look forward to uh, publication and continued work and success in your research. Thank you so much. And that concludes, I think, our first panel of the day. Thank you, and what a fascinating discussion that was. And now to moderate our second panel, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christine Sylvester, who's a professor at the University of Connecticut and has also done uh, a variety of work around the world, has been a, affiliated with the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, uh, and has done uh, a great deal of historic research into the social fabric uh, of culture. And we're delighted that she could join us today to moderate the second panel. Thank you. So are we live on the second panel now? Good. Um, well, greetings and welcome to a panel on museums uh, as cultural part of cultural diplomacy. And as you just heard, I'm, a, I'm Christine Sylvester. I'm a professor of political science, mainly international relations at the University of Connecticut and a permanent professorial affiliate at the School of Global Studies uh, at Gothenburg. I pursued a variety of research topics over the years. Uh, from feminist international relations to development studies focusing on Africa and Zimbabwe in particular, to war as experience, people's experience. And they all, in a sense, converge. It's not like you move from one to the other. They all managed to converge at this point in my interest in the international relations of art and museums. So my most recent book is Curating and Recurating the American Wars in Vietnam and Iraq taking what is a core topic in international relations war and really uh, pushing it into different areas. It explores the varieties of objects and approaches exhibited on these wars at the National Museum of American History, the Smithsonian, at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, at Arlington Cemetery, and, which is a bit provocative, in six war novels and memoirs by American, Vietnamese, and Iraqi uh, authors. I also have an earlier book on art museums, international relations where we least expect it, uh, which considers the British Museum, the Getty, MoMA, and the Guggenheim Bilbao, and the museumification of Ground Zero in New York City. Um, I think I was one of the people that introduced this to a very hardcore guns and bombs field, actually, and managed to survive. Uh, anyway, I have a forthcoming article that's coming out in the British International Relations Journal Millennium comparing uh, the Australian War Memorial's very, very enthusiastic displays of military and war uh, uh, with the Hiroshima Peace Park and its emphasis on children killed by the atom bomb in World War II. It's two very different cultural powerhouses. So it's a great pleasure to be here today and to introduce 
and discuss three papers on the theme of cultural diplomacy, which I'm very interested in. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to introduce each uh, speaker and each paper in turn right before they, they speak as opposed to doing it all in the beginning. So let's get ready here. We'll start with Maria Luke Marina. I hope I, I, I pronounce this properly, who is the Director for Cultural Affairs at the Spain US Cultural uh, Council Foundation, you know, Spain US Council Foundation. Uh, she has many degrees from universities in Spain, including an MBA in cultural management and an MA in North American studies. And she's currently working on a PhD on public diplomacy cultural tools that have influenced relations between Spain and the United States. And her paper title is Exhibiting Cultural Diplomacy, Lessons on Spain-US Relations Drawn from Two Recent Museum Shows. So Maria, here you go. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Sylvester. It is my pleasure to be here today joining this Global Humanities Symposium from, from Spain, from Madrid, and having the opportunity to, to observe cultural diplomacy with these outstanding professionals make me feel a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, I'm not yet in the academic um, field, but, but, but I kind of feel that, that we are gonna have a, a great talk. And I would like to thank both the Meridian Center for Cultural Diplomacy and the National Endowment for the Humanities for, for organizing this, this event and, and also for the support during, during the, previous, the previous weeks. Exhibiting cultural diplomacy represents one of the most um, relevant activities that the Fundación Consejo España Estados Unidos, the foundation, the institution which I represent here uh, today, has undertaken in its uh, recent history. Although as I was mentioning, uh, we cannot share with you what could be considered an academic analysis. We, we truly believe that our experience in the cultural field uh, may be of interest for two reasons. One, uh, due to the genuineness of our uh, institution in Spain, which is quite unique, and also and probably most importantly, because of what culture has come to to teach us, uh, to, to the foundation and, and to the members of, of the foundation about the power to connect and, and establish relations between, between both countries. And in this talk, I would like firstly to introduce uh, briefly uh, the institution, the Fundación, identifying the five W's, who we are, what we do, when, where, and on why we do it. And afterwards, I will again, briefly present these two main exhibitions uh, that we have been working on in recent years. And, and with this in mind, I think we could go to the final part of the conversation when, and as I mentioned in the title, uh, we can address some of the lessons that we have learned um, from our experiences and the uh, relevance of, of that cultural diplomacy um, has, has played in the pursuit of, of, of our goals. Let me just switch. I don't know if it's work. Yes, here. So um, let me introduce the Fundacion. Uh, we are a private nonprofit organization. It's formed mainly by large corporations, cultural and academic institution. Uh, the Secretary General is a diplomat, former ambassador, and the president is a personality from the private sector. It was created in 1997, and the purpose was to, to strengthen the ties between two countries that they're uh, highly related, Spain and the United States. Uh, the US has always been a, a key country uh, in Spain's foreign agenda. And, and of course, the historical links are, are sustained to, to present. Uh, and together, there's also a solid alliance uh, in politics, defense, economy, among other, other fields. So the creation of this foundation that focus on promoting um, but we can say a pluralistic dialogue between uh, both civil societies was rapidly um, supported by many actors in, in both public and private and private sectors. We also have a counterpart in the in the US, which is the uh, US Spain Council. Um, and we share the same goals here in Spain. It's promoting the cooperation between both countries, as I mentioned, to enhance the uh, mutual recognition and to propose actions to our respective governments to, to develop our, um, our relations. So through, through, through our history, the foundation 
has created um, what we can say a, a, a brand activity, so a, a, a series of activities to carry out our mission. The very first one, on one of the most relevant, is the uh, the forum, the Spain United States Forum, which is one of the longest activities um, that we have been working on, and it's an annual. Um, private meeting um, that it's held by members of both of organization um, and we uh, get together uh, to to discuss issues that are um, of joint interest for for both uh, for both boards and uh, usually we focus on economic technological political and sometimes as well cultural areas and after uh, 25 ongoing editions, with the sole exception of, of, the, of 2020 due to COVID pandemia, the forum, um, we can say that has consolidated itself as the principal uh, platform for dialogue between the civil societies uh, in Spain and, and the US. Together with this forum, the Fundación has also, let's say another classical tool in public diplomacy, uh, which is a long lived and, and pretty successful visitors program it's called the um, U.S. Young Leaders Program that was created in 2001 and has also been going uninterruptedly until last year, and we will uh, retake it next year. And uh, yearly, we organize a visit to Spain for uh, 10 young Americans who are, uh, we call it leaders or young leaders, upcoming leaders in their respective fields. And the objective of this program is to provide them um, a view of what Spain is today uh, with a, a weekly program. Um, in, informally, we can say it's like an influencer's training program. So we give them the, the, the opportunity to visit and to know how, how Spain is, is, um, is today. We have other programs such as um, a fellowship program with Spanish companies. We have also an award, the Bernardo de Galvez Award, established also in in 2007, um, with which we, can, we want to um, honor and, and acknowledge the um, efforts that, um, let me just switch to this, uh, sorry, to this up here, you can see some pictures about uh, the work that the Fundación does. Um, so with this award, we want to, uh, to recognize the work that uh, some citizens or American institutions um, do, especially to foster the cooperation between our both countries, the Hispanic Society, Senator Tim Kaine, or most, recent, most recently, um, the Library of the Congress have been uh, awarded with, with, uh, with our prize. Um, so far, uh, I have uh, identified some of the most prominent activities, but we have many others. And you might be thinking, and what about culture? What about culture in the, in the Fundación? Is that important? Of course, we've been working in a wide range of, of activities. And during many years, they have been focused on mainly on political economy and also historical um, arena, which were the most interest for, for our uh, members of, of our board. But um, 2014, is a key year for the uh, Fundación because a new and, and a pretty successful stage was inaugurated when the Fundación decided to focus a good part of, of its effort in the cultural field uh, when we inaugurated our first uh, prominent um, exhibition. And I'm going to just switch to uh, the second part of, of the presentation because we started working with the main exhibition called Design in America, Spain's imprint in the US that had um, two steps. The first one was with the Spanish name, as you can see here, Diseñar America, um, which opened it in the National um, Library in Madrid in 2014, where we expose and explore the role played by Spanish technology and inventors and urban planners in uh, designing and creating the, the very fabric and infrastructure of um, daily uh, of daily life, um, parts of what today it's, um, it's America. Uh, the original exhibition opened, as I was saying, in uh, the National Library in 2014, but right afterwards in 2015, it started a tour uh, along the, the United States and it had uh, four venues there, 
and uh, it lasted until 2019, where we received in total over more than 100,000 visitors. We stopped in Washington, Houston, Santa Barbara, and, and also um, San Antonio, Texas. Um, the support that this exhibition has received in both sides of the Atlantic, um, we will see that transcends by far the number of visitors because many sponsor local institutions, uh, regional, and also on the top of that, uh, the main authority of Spain, His Majesty the King, that inaugurated both the uh, first venue in Madrid and also the closing one in San Antonio, that provide uh, an, an accolade to the project and, and, and to, its, uh, to its worth. Um, and with this experience under our belt, the Fundación um, assumed the uh, production management and, and also the, the, the sponsorship of our current exhibition, which is called Invisible, um, Invisible Immigrant uh, Spaniards in the United States. Let me just show you a little bit. Um, we are focusing now on a very different um, scenario. We're focusing on those tens of thousands of working class Spaniards that emigrated to the United States in the late, late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, which story is largely unknown, uh, invisible, as we say in the title, in both um, Spain and the, and the US. And for the last 10 years, the uh, curators, James Fernandez, a professor from MOU, and Luis Argeo, a journalist and a filmmaker from Spain, they have been struggling to make this history visible before this uh, disappears for, for good. They came to present us the project and we realized that that was the perfect match. They had the story, we, the Fundación, had the uh, know-how and the machine. So that was um, the, the perfect uh, match as we used to say, and we started working um, together. The exhibition uses these photographs, documents, film footage, objects that the creators found in the homes of the descendants to reconstruct these um, trials and spirit and also the, the, the emotions of this fascinating but almost lost chapter of the history of immigration. Uh, we uh, inaugurate the exhibition in an extremely complicated year, 2020, in Madrid, uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, but uh, we had also um, a, a, an enormous success, uh, both in the media and also in the visitors, even though it was, as, as we uh, as we all know, a very, a very complicated, um, very complicated years. And um, just, I would like to underline two, um, two considerations and about these two exhibitions. The first one is that both use original research and um, with the primary goal of educating a general audience, both in Spain and the, and the US, about little known connections. That's one of the main goals of the Fundación, to work on those connections that or even have been lost or they are uh, rarely or unknown. And both uh, strive uh, to shift the focus away from the events and or the phenomena that we are used to monopolize on the discussions on Spain and US relation, which as you may probably know, I'm, I'm speaking about the military conquest, the colonization. Um, with this exhibition, we are striving to go towards other lesser uh, known chapters. And I think this is one of the points of, of, their, of, their, um, of their success. And I, the, I think with this panoramic overview, about who we are and what we have been doing, uh, specifically on the uh, cultural and the exhibition um, field, um, we have, or I would like to share with you, three uh, reflections, three uh, thoughts that, that we have um, arrived to. And the first one is that um, the, let me just switch here, you can see some other here. Um, the ship, uh, the foundation, uh, original emphasis on hard power scenarios from public diplomacy, such as uh, economy, politics, or defense, uh, we have uh, moved towards um, our current position where a uh, soft power classical tool, again, such as culture, is much more relevant nowadays for us than it was 10, 15, or 20 years ago. Uh, there are still many people that consider probably that in a foundation like ours, uh, where our board is as focused on economy and on trade, 
the culture is something uh, maybe like a window dressing, but it is not. And we have realized that uh, our exhibition and their undeniable success in visitors, in media, in third party interest, they have been essential to full, to empower this transition, to, uh, to recognize why culture is so important, uh, even though that was not at the beginning or at the conception of the, um, of the Fundación. And um, we have also realized uh, with, uh, with our exhibitions, we, as I already mentioned, they're very different fields, uh, and it was not something we were planning at all. We have realized that both of our projects have an unusual common element. Um, they're not projects where country A takes truths to country B, as maybe in a classical uh, or in an attempt not to educate or influence public opinion, which would, could be a much more classical procedure on public diplomacy. The truths or, or the statements that Design in America was carrying uh, and also uh, invisible immigrant were really discovered in the process of creating the programs. And, and in many cases, we were a revelation in, in both countries. It, the proof of that is that both exhibitions have been designed to tour both countries. And both, in fact, have started nor, not in the States, but in Spain. So they started touring first in Spain, and afterwards, they have moved to, to, to the States. And um, the stories, we have realized that they're as new and fresh, both in Spain and in the States. So uh, the uh, difference between uh, the host country and the home country of the exhibition gets slightly blurred uh, with, with the exhibitions we have been carrying. And, and, and that's something we, we really want to think about because that, that, that gives, gives us a lesson that we are probably working in the, in the right way because we are working on a scenarios that are uh, not had been touched before. And, and as a, also, and this would be the, the, the third and, and the last of, of, of my key points or reflections, as a consequence, I would say of this relatively unplanned nature of, of the foundation evolution, because this, this is an observation, it's not, not something that was planned. Now we are going to focus on, on, on culture. It's something that just happened and, and started to be, to be important uh, as, a re, it, it, as a result of the, also the difficulty for us to calibrate the effect of these interventions in cultural diplomacy, we, we really find a complication on measuring. Uh, for us, it's nearly impossible, maybe we will learn in the future, I hope so, uh, to not to show data on precise tables, but to measure the impact. Um, uh, I was thinking when I was preparing the intervention, what, what, what I have to say, I am surrounded of, of professionals and of academics. I don't have um, data, I don't have numbers, I don't have uh, numbers to show, but instead I, I say maybe it's better to share uh, our worries about how difficult it is to, um, to convince sometimes our patrons, our sponsors uh, about the, uh, the importance of, of undertaking this kind of projects because we cannot share a numbers or, or figures or a ticket income, but rather instead we have articles in media. We have an enormous program of activities surrounding the, um, the uh, exhibitions. We have a lot of actors that they want to be involved in our projects. We have dozens of testimonies of people that, that write, to, write messages to us telling us how important it was for them to, to know their history, to know better who they are, and to realize that we are connected to the states and they had no idea. And the same on the other side. And also we have uh, reached a permanent collaboration with many institutions that we were not able to do it in, in, in other way or, or with other projects. And some of these no data examples that support the success of our projects in the end, uh, make us both proud and sure that 
our bet on cultural diplomacy through exhibitions is the good way. We want to keep on learning. We want to keep on opening new, new ideas. But even though we cannot assure with numbers, besides visitors and, and other uh, data, we believe we are we're in the right um, direction, or at least that's what we feel. And also, the board is, is really uh, recognizing the, the value of our um, of our bet and and we that, that's why to get today we wanted to to share our experiences uh with you from from spain because the us is such an important uh country and 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 an example for us not only in the foundation but but also in, in our country so thank you very much for for your uh for your time thank you christine <laughs> thank you maria it's a very very interesting project um, I love the uh, the way you're characterizing it as, as open and sort of, in a sense, and I don't mean this negatively, stumbling along. I mean, when something is interesting and, and emerges, you kind of incorporate that. I like that. It's so different from academia, where if you want to raise money to do a project, cultural or otherwise, you have to uh, be able to measure the impact <laughs> that it's going to have on a certain audience. I mean, it's a really, I mean, particularly in the UK, where I worked for a number of years, that's, that is just, you know, who is going to be influenced and how. Um, I'm going to come back and ask an actual question ha having to do that uh, at the end after we've heard all three papers, but thank you. It's a fascinating project. All right, so the second uh, paper is co-authored by Dr. Sarah E.K. Smith and Dr. Jeffrey Bryson. Uh, Dr. Smith is uh, an assistant professor of communications and media studies at Carleton University a fellow as well of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute and a founding member of a very interesting initiative called the North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative. The co-author is Dr. Bryson, an associate professor of history at Queen's University in Canada and an associate of the Wilson uh, Institute for Canadian History at McMaster University and also a founding member of this North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative, which is really quite fascinating. The paper title is Observing Cultural Diplomacy, Canadian Museums and Global Engagement, 2009 to 2019. So, please. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm joining you today from Ottawa, Ontario, which is located on the traditional and unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation, where I work at Carleton University. And I'm grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands and acknowledge territory uh, as part of an intentional and meaningful commitment to understanding the impact in history of colonialism and doing the work necessary to disrupt and dismantle this legacy. So Jeff and I are really pleased to be able to participate in this event and this panel today and want to thank the conference organizers for bringing together such a wonderful program. Today, we're going to be sharing our recent research into Canadian museum diplomacy, which takes shape as this paper, as well as a forthcoming open access report that's going to be released this fall. I want to begin with the assessment made in 2016 by Director General for Culture and Communication in Germany's Foreign Office, Andreas Gergen. Gergen characterized museums as the diplomats of the 21st century discussing the mediating role these cultural institutions play in global relations, he argued that museums and their personnel facilitate dialogue through professional and personal networks that are independent of and often supersede the economic and political rivalries associated with formal state to state relations. Gergen's comments mark an increasing awareness on the part of scholars such as uh, our moderator, Christine Sylvester, and event participant, Natalia Guncheva, of museums' multifaceted international activities. Whether through exhibitions, programming, collaborative research, fieldwork, um, museums are embedded in global webs of cultural relations. Here. Oh. Just get my slides set. So our research surveys the roles played by Canadian institutions as they engage in the museum version of what Nicholas Cull refers to as the new diplomacy. 
So this is based on research conducted in 2018 and 19 for the project, The Global Engagement of Museums in Canada, which was MITAX funded and a multi-partner collaborative research project gathering preliminary baseline data and qualitative analyses of 10 Canadian museums global activities within uh, a 10 year span within between 2009 and 2019 marking it as the first such study of cross Canada museum diplomacy. Our case study institutions uh, are listed here on the slide and they included the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the Pointe Calière Montreal Archaeology and History Complex, the Canadian Museum of History, the National Gallery of Canada, the Ottawa Art Gallery, the Royal Ontario Museum, the Aga Khan Museum, the Art Gallery of Alberta, and the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. So in terms of our research questions, in the study we ask first, in what ways do Canadian museums engage through professional and personal networks that span political boundaries and divisions? Second, how do museums advance a variety of productive international partnerships? And finally, what innovative methods exist for engaging and bridging distinct and at times opposing communities? The results of our study demonstrate the role that cultural institutions and individual culture workers play in mediating conflict and promoting productive dialogue. Our research also contributes a holistic analysis of international engagement by addressing a range of activities that are rarely brought together as subjects for institutional study. So these include research, programming, advancement, professional networking, and institutional partnership development. Now, our interest in examining the cultural diplomacy of Canadian museums stems from our work with the North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative, or NACTI, which is a transdisciplinary multi-sector research network made up of scholars, policymakers, and a wide variety of practitioners. And NACTI was founded in 2017 to advance a broad and critical understanding of cultural diplomacy one that moves beyond a focus on states and their formal diplomatic representatives to encompass a wider range of cultural actors, communities, and disciplinary knowledges. As part of the NACTI agenda, our research engages with scholarship that recognizes the building and management of global relations is no longer solely the work of hegemonic Cold War club of nation states, nor the product of the Westphalian interstate systems that predate it. In line with the body of scholarship that has charted this shift, as Jorge Heine puts it, from club to network diplomacy, we argue that in the global era, the rules, the patterns, the mores of engagement are being established by a myriad of newly empowered non-state actors. And these include anti-racist activists, scientists, artists, educators, administrators, entrepreneurs, cultural institutions, indigenous communities, diasporas, cities, NGOs and nonprofit organizations, philanthropists, and others, others whose power is cultural as well as political and economic. The complex civil society networks of power constructed by these new diplomats, including museums, work both with and against status diplomacy to engage with the key challenges of today. Now, of course, museums have long engaged on a global scale, and this is evidenced in the Canadian museum sector by institutions such as the National Gallery of Canada, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and the Royal Ontario Museum, who have been major players in cosmopolitan networks for decades. These initiatives have deepened and broadened in the 21st century, particularly through the rise of satellite museums, the ever expanding web of international partnerships, the popularization of museum brands such as the MoMA, the Met, the V&A, and the proliferation of blockbuster international touring exhibitions, as well as the increase to include uh, even smaller institutions in these uh, exhibition networks. 
The sector's extending transnational reach has been accompanied by a growing recognition on behalf of scholars like John Robert Kelly, James Rosano, and Jan Mellison of the importance of museums as forming a powerful subset of non-state actors who are major players in global relations. This new understanding of a more broadly defined cultural diplomacy and the increasing recognition of the range and importance of museums' international activities as they engage in the new diplomacy points to the need for our research, which offers a critical assessment of museum internationalism in the Canadian context. It also points to the need for conversations such as those initiated by this panel. And we think it's important to underscore that while a great deal of cultural diplomacy literature is celebratory, lauding the ability of museums and their epistemic networks to bring people together, the history of museum activity makes apparent that bringing cultures into contact is not necessarily positive. Museums can be instrumentalized for their for geopolitical purposes by states and private patrons whose goals and agendas may run counter to a museum stated goals, their professional agendas and their community priorities. So we must grapple with the long and continuing history of museums as colonial institutions as illustrated by scholars. Um, and there are many of them, including James Clifford, Ruth Phillips and Amy Lone Tree and critically address their dimensions of power to recognize their hegemonic function as ideological apparatuses of government and governance. Our research also recognizes Canada's uh, unique soft power history, including its legacy as a middle power and as a junior partner to the superpowers of what Surgeon Yushetik identifies as the racialized Anglosphere or the English speaking world. Canada's historic relationship and it to and involvement with both the British and American imperial projects is crucial to understanding the cultural context underlying the global contemporary activities of its museum sector. So our research reveals that the museums in our study are seeking to thoughtfully examine their place, their privilege, and their cultural power. Royal Ontario Museum Director Josh Bassages identify colonial history as a key challenge to museums. What is the role of encyclopedic museums in a post-colonial world, asked Bassages. Global work, he cautions, has to be entered into with an awareness that there are different ways of knowing and different insights, and that we need to meet people and institutions, regardless of where they are, at a level of parity, rather than assuming that we are going to be missionaries of knowledge. Thanks, Sarah. I'm pleased to join this conversation from Kingston, Ontario, and from the traditional and unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabek Nation, where I work at Queen's University. We selected the institutions in our study not because they represent an, hom an homogenous Canada, but because as a group they represent a variety of experience and activity. They vary in terms of region, age, mandate, and funding structure geopolitical spheres of their global work, size and scale, and in their relationship to various levels of state and with private patronage. We also included a subset of institutions known particularly, particularly for their relationship to, the, to Indigenous arts and cultures, specifically because we recognize that any study of cultural diplomacy must include examination of the ways that Indigenous communities engage in cultural relations, with and through settler colonial institutions, with non-Indigenous peoples, and with a wider global Indigenous community. While we adapt, adopt the Canadian frame for our study, the project nonetheless resists a simplistic methodological nationalism. That is to say, we resist what Eve Darian Smith and Philip McCarty call the often taken for granted framework rooted in modernity that situates situates the nation state as the natural and primary unit of analysis and social organization. By demonstrating the importance of specificity and emphasizing how institutions work differently in various regional, economic, geopolitical, and cultural contexts, we seek to counter claims of a national universalism that in its current Canadian iteration seeks to instrumentalize cultural diversity to increase Canada's attractiveness and credibility abroad in its version of what Joseph Nye has called its meta soft power. Our project was designed as a co-production between industry partners, 
including our lead partner and host in institution, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and nine other case study institutions Sarah referred to earlier in the paper. The study encompassed the work of many researchers, including Sarah and I as primary investigators, other senior scholars and practitioners, and 10 graduate students from the Cultural Studies and History programs at Queen's University, who participated in two research residencies under our leadership at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts in 2019. As one of Canada's preeminent cultural institutions with a long history of international cultural engagement dating back to the end of the 19th century, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts was a logical starting point and home base for our research team. We structured the Montreal research residencies as opportunities to engage in collaborative research and to develop the project as a means of pedagogy. We conceptualized our project, project as a social science or humanities lab in order to co-produce research with our team of students, drawing on varied experiences, on their varied experiences, disciplinary knowledges and perspectives to inform the project's direction and development. Following the first research residency in Montreal, we assigned each student one institution where over the summer months, they conducted archival research and interviews with key personnel at various levels of their organization. Each researcher then prepared a report charting their museum's global engagement and impact over the last 10 years and brought it back to the group in a second research residency at the end of the summer. While the specifics of global work, of the global work our museums engaged in varied greatly, the following key findings and trends emerged from our collective read of the individual institutional reports. We discovered that all the museums we studied are intrinsically global in nature. For some of the institutions we examine, global engagement has long been a priority. Others are newer, newer to the game. We found too that size matters in terms of the scale of activities as reflected in both day-to-day -day professional exchange within the transnational museum sector and in such special activities as touring exhibitions and multi-partner research projects. But although the scale and nature of engagement varied greatly from the activities of, of established global heavyweights like the Montreal Museum of Fine Art and the Royal Ontario Museum uh, to those of smaller and newer players like the Art Gallery of Alberta, all of our case study institutions were playing in the global game. Canadians, we found too that Canadian museums form a professionalized community of practice. Despite differences in size and scale and experience, our team found that when our case study museums engage globally, they do so within a shared range of activities and in similar modes of professionalism, reflecting common practices of employment, definitions of museum work, shared intellectual agendas, and shared codes of ethics. We found too that local contexts and institutional mandates allow and facilitate innovation, innovative activities. Our research team discovered great diversity in the global engagement practiced by the museums due to local, due to local context, professional relationships and unique institutional mandates. The Art Gallery of Alberta, of, uh, sorry, the Ottawa Art Gallery, for instance, benefits from its unique location in the nation, national capital with access to the formal diplomatic community centered in the city's embassies and missions. The Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, for its part, is deeply engaged in a global network of immigration museums and has deep ties to Global Affairs Canada. And the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts has long been a big player and innovator on the blockbuster circuit. Excuse me. We also found that the global engagement of museums is not necessarily perceived or understood through the framework of cultural diplomacy. Museum practitioners on our team interviewed seldom saw their work, their global work as cultural diplomacy in those terms. Rather, they simply see it as part of their job, aspects of their professional and intellectual practices. While they rarely see themselves as the new diplomats Gergen speaks of, or as players in a new diplomacy, their work is indicative of the extent to which the museum sector is 
a deeply transnational epistemic community. Finally, our research findings demonstrate forcefully that we need to move away from simplistic and unitary notions of status diplomacy in order to understand, value, and validate the global work of non-state actors such as museums. This necessitates, among other things, a move away from seeing diplomacy merely as it exists in formal structures governed by nation states and in the interstate systems they create and perpetuate. In 2019, the Canadian Senate released a landmark study titled Cultural Diplomacy at the Front Stage of Canada's Foreign Policy, which offers a glimpse into the recent past and present state of Canadian cultural diplomacy. Despite an otherwise thorough examination, it is, and despite its bold call to make cultural diplomacy an enduring pillar of Canada's foreign policy, the role of museums as cultural diplomats is barely recognized in the report. Museums are not even referenced in any of the report's eight recommendations. Our research into the global work of Canadian museums seeks to address this gap and, suggests, and to suggest how Canadian cultural institutions engage as actors on the world stage. As Sarah noted earlier, this research will be shared in the forthcoming open access report titled The Global Engagements of Museums in Canada, which will be available this fall. This research is part of an emerging conversation among scholars, practitioners, and institutions taking place at a variety of levels of engagement from the local to the global and witness and panels like the one we're sharing with all of you today. Our, our research also provides baseline, baseline data to inform these conversations to suggest new ways of thinking about cultural diplomacy in museums and, demonstrate, and to demonstrate the viability of such work by, as Lee Davidson and Letitia Perez Castellanos put it, broadening discussions of how museums articulate and demonstrate value through the creation of a new language for narrow, narrating their social purpose. Our research shows that at a moment when right-wing populism and resurgent nationalism mark a refusal to engage with diverse communities within and outside of national and interstate frames, museums can promote the cultural competencies necessary for productive intercultural relationships. And we hope they can do so and continue to do so on a truly global scale. Thank you. Okay. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I've got several questions I'm going to raise if I have a chance at the end, but uh, I find this initiative and this, and one, one thing I would query, maybe just think about is, you know, haven't museums always been global in the things they sort of grab <clears throat> and, and, and bring home? Um, and, uh, is, and, and whether states are sort of co-opting the cultural in the in diplomacy, of turning it into something that mimics a little bit sort of state diplomacy. But anyway, let us carry on to the third paper. I'm very interested in this paper, um, having been a person who's worked in, in Africa. The third paper is also co-authored by Dr. Antonio Kyler and Kamal Patterson. Dr. Kyler, and I hope I'm saying your name properly, is an associate professor of arts administration at Florida State University in the US and visiting associate professor of theater and drama at the University of Michigan in the US. And Kamal Patterson is a cultural heritage law analyst for Archive. am I saying that right? I don't know if I'm saying that right. A cultural heritage database and startup promoting due diligence in the art market and antiquities trade, rather interesting. Now this paper um, has the interesting title of France and the Restitution of African Cultural Property, a Critical Race Theory View, which many of you will recognize as kind of this huge debate uh, in the United States over meaning of, of critical race theory. So it's, it's very, very uh, current. So please. Thank you, Dr. Sylvester. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Antonio C. Kyler, and I'm joining you today from Tallahassee, Florida, where the Appalachian Nation, Muskogee Creek Nation, the Kisiki Tribe of Florida, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida stored the land. I see that this land remains scarred by the histories and ongoing legacies of settler colonial violence, dispossession, and removal. 
And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kamal Patterson. Um, I am joining you here from Maryland. I wish that I had um, a better understanding of the tribal lands on which I am situated, but I definitely give thanks um, and recognize and acknowledge uh, their existence and continue cultural struggle for visibility. And um, so to start, I'll provide you all with an overview of our paper. Uh, we're going to start with the rationale and the research question. I'll discuss a little bit about critical race theory. And then my colleague, uh, Kamal, will talk about French history, law, and race. And then we will conclude uh, the paper, please. So um, to start, while well, speaking at, uh, to students at Burkina Faso's University of Agodougou, President Macron stated, starting today and within the next five years, I want to see the conditions put in place to allow for the temporary and definitive restitution of African cultural heritage to Africa. Uh, too often, however, the discourses about the restitution of African cultural property exclude the perspective of the formerly colonized, especially if they are of African descent. And as an example, in our paper, we talk about um, Mwazulu Diabanza, who is a, uh, an activist, uh, particularly he's um, really kind of protesting colonial history in Africa. And he has been going to European museums and staging um, really kind of appearing that he's taking um, art that or objects that were taken colonially. And um, of course, he's doing this as a, um, a kind of performance of protest because he never gets far enough out of the museums to, to really take the objects. Um, but he his perspective is um, very unique to our paper because it really uh, considers the ways in which people of African descent are protesting colonial, colonialism and requesting their objects back. The extent literature provides insights into how France might realize uh, Macron's vision, Paquette remained sympathetic to French colonizers whose resistance to the restitution of African cultural property continues to cause creative, cultural, psychological, and spiritual harm to people of African descent. Considering all this led us to the research question, in what ways might critical race theory inform policies and practices on the restitution of African cultural property from France back to African nations? And while CRT was developed for the analysis of how racial conceptions and perceptions undergird the structure of US common law, it can also be used to analyze the biases that compel France to not seriously engage with granting access to archival documents and collections, which are critical for African cultural restitution claims. And also, we must address how France deliberately restructured its public collection system to thwart such claims. The letter of the law is often inadequate to explain these inequitable outcomes in African cultural restitution from France. Critical race theory goes beyond the idea that efficiency, order, and fairness to individuals should be the particular basis for the application of the law. Proponents of CRT look at legal history and precedent and have found that the neutral idea of efficiency, order, and fairness has been used to dismiss colorable collective claims of inequity. Efficiency, order, and fairness are universal values within US courts, yet they exist independently of any one society or community. CRT recognizes the idea of universality as a value that centers the individual before US courts of law. French law also recognizes this concept of universality as well, most famously in the 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. However, the declaration would run into the evolving concept of race within the French empire. Some Frenchmen would challenge a rigid definition of race as they encountered various African peoples. Nevertheless, a lack in the belief um, that Africans were indeed rational often define colonial interactions, the conferral of legal status, 
and the revocation of individual or collective rights amid policies of association, assimilation, and absorption. As it relates to African culture in French public museums, the idea of universality is problematic. It subverts African restitution claims because African collective ownership is often subsumed under the idea of fairness to the individual adventurer that brought these discoveries to France and cultivated the study and marketing of them. The adventurer is the one who represents the quest for individual knowledge, glory, merit, and recognition through discovery. Ideals that are universal within the unit of the individual. For example, the nature of Chad's colonial administrators shows the importance of it, these adventurers to the colonial policy of cultural looting. Debus says that because the region was considered both difficult and unprofitable, the colony was left in the hands of colonial soldiers and administrators who were often novices and adventurers. Uh, the French ruled Chad through the use of force. Moreover, Debos asserted that pillage was also an integral part of French strategy in Chad. There are 9,296 Chadian objects inventoried in French public museums, more than from any other part of Africa. France wanted to preserve these objects in posterity and perpetuity. So museum objects resulting from gifts or inheritance benefit from ex an explicit inalienability. Following the cultural heritage code and the material in question is controlled by the civil code. The French civil code does not distinguish based on whether the donor was a private or a public person. Finally, French law allows for the minister of culture to declare a work as cultural property and register it as such. Once this process occurs, the title vests completely in the French state. No one can ever gain title to register property, not even by adverse possession. In the 1960s, France would restructure its colonial collections so that they would be beyond repatriation. The administration of these collections would be transferred to ensure French sovereignty by giving them to the Ministry of Culture and the Direction de Musées de France. These protocols were a way to symbolically absorb these objects a second time. The first symbolic gesture being their translocation and affirm their inalienable place as a part of French national assets of cultural heritage. Now, Simone Weil was an early 20th century French thinker who condemned the brutal suppression of all local traditions through French colonial bu bureaucracy and would condemn the use of bureaucracy to uproot African cultures. Weil's scholarship of acknowledging the violence of discovery obscured through unfeeling bureaucracy is important. Legal bureaucracy sustains the vast public correct collections of African artifacts, many of which were donated by prominent individuals. These off-critique artifacts are insulated from particular claims by individuals or nations that the, because the bureaucracy has subscribed to these pieces a nationalist or rationalist value that serves individualist notions of projecting nationhood and imposing enlightenment values. Nationhood or aspirations to it are universal values that are used to justify violating the rights of others in search of union domestically. France violated the rights of African subjects and citizens using the law in the colonies and in the metropole by creating a culture of the universal within its cultural heritage laws that ignores or dismisses particularly particular injuries and, and iniquities. The SAR Savoir report examined and categorized these, inquiry, these inequities to assess whether or not there was a lack of consent to the transport or expropriation of African cultural heritage. 
access to national archives are critical to their inquiries and those of other scholars. And um, over to you, Dr. Kyler. So extent literature um, remains remiss of anti-Black racism impact on the restitution of African cultural property. This compelled us to explore the research question in what ways might critical race theory inform policies and practices on the restitution of African cultural property from France back to African nations. Using CRT provided us with a theoretical lens to discuss the proverbial elephant in the room of anti-Black racism and France's resistance to the rep repatriation of African cultural property. We explicitly and unequivocally support the definitive restitution of all ill-acquired African cultural property from France back to its country of origin and former colonies, including US museums who have claimed that Black Lives Matter. French domestic laws were used to justify taking and keeping plunder from Africa. The SARS of Boy report found that the lack of consent should guide French repatriation of cultural, of looted cultural objects back to Africa. However, Africans have a Sisyphean task. They must assess consent to expropriation without the archival tools and physical evidence needed to properly investigate colonial inequities and place looted artifacts in their proper context. By exploring these spaces of evidentiary deficit, we can begin to understand the adverse impact of French colonial looting and the obligation to return these artifacts because they embody cultural memory. Because of these deficits of access, CRT promotes storytelling as a valid means of intuiting the behavior and biases of the colonial world to illustrate that what appeared to be consent was really sacrifice or artifice employed to avoid, avoid cultural destruction or collective punishment. Many stakeholders are needed to tell stories, to raise awareness of African cultural patrimony and restitution. Artists, including artists of African descent, are engaged in the issue of African cultural restitution in Europe, Artists tweet about, write rap songs, make discoveries, produce choreography, host workshops, and install art on this topic, according to Sar and Savoy. Brahman said, arts bodies can use treaty language to insist their institutions engage equitably with their less powerful counterparts and share information to assist and develop claims for restitution. France, Taking the step to repatriate African artifacts via treaty may spur other formal colonial powers to do the same. Cultural diplomacy between African countries and France will remain challenged and strained by the historic and equitable relationship that exists between the formerly colonized and one of their colonizers. Too many African creatives and citizens will continue to lack access to their ancestral inspiration and cultural birthright, further undermining the preservation of their critical cultural heritage and contributions to humanity. And finally, we propose that future research on the restitution of African cultural property should explore the ways in which anti-Black racism challenges and informs these discourses in Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, the UK, and of course, the US. Thank you. Thank you. Mute myself. All right, very interesting. So now we have a, a period of time, uh, about almost a half hour, uh, where we can raise some questions or you can speak to each other. Actually, uh, I think that sometimes you have your points you want to raise too, not just you know, an audience. Let me start because I was asked to uh, think of a few questions. And I'd like to start and work from the third paper back to the first. Um, I'm really fascinated by this, this whole restitution issue and cultural heritage law and what have you. Uh, and I wrote in I, my first book on the art museums and international relations really suspected about the whole, at the time, really blown up Parthenon sculpture. 
uh, issue in the British Museum with, with, with Brice just constructing a very beautiful state-of-the-art museum at the Acropolis for the return of these statues. And this, this seemingly delicate, I, I'm very skeptical of the word diplomacy, but the seemingly delicate conversation not on a level playing field. You know, and it it was a very it was a very difficult time, and I know that on the on the at one level of the the new Greek uh, Parthenon uh, Museum at the time, they had sort of images of the missing sculptures covered with cloth. They were like ghosts. They were like ghosts, and you were to walk through and, and see that that the British had not bothered to actually um, return them, and and and. And then when it gets to African heritage, it, of course, it gets more complicated. It's further apart. Um, and the, the field is just not level in terms of this talk. When we talk about the soft power of diplomacy, oh boy, for someone in the field of international relations, really soft for whom? You know, you have to have the resources. You have to have the playing field. You have to have the clout. You know, you have to really uh, be able to answer questions that are raised by museum specialists on, well, will you have the security for these objects? Well, will you have the ventilation system required to preserve them? Well, on and on and on. Um, um, and pretty soon you're losing in a sense, unless you've raised the money already in advance for these types of things. So I just think it's something we have to just not accept as a term, because if you step outside of your field into mine, um, you know, you see, you saw under, under the Trump administration what diplomacy was like with Europe, all right? It was like, are oh, you going to do it my way or, or, you know, get lost type of thing. This can happen over and over again. I was wondering how you would you, you think about that in, in, in respect to the restitution issue. And also, I'm also thinking of in, ter in terms of um, African-American accessibility to objects that return to Africa, okay? Um, it's, of course, people should have their, their, their objects, I feel, you know, back. At the same time, it's such a complex question because people from regions have moved around the world and they want the access and, and sort of traveling such a distance is somewhat unrealistic for an awful lot of people. So how does this work, you know, in terms of um, not necessarily the critical race theory, but it's in terms of practical museum concerns? Well, you know, one question that, kept coming up uh, for me is, why do European museums want to hold on to these objects? Yeah. Mm. The psychology of the, the colonizer and um, this idea of having an object communicate something to you about your supremacy, your superiority, um, even if it's fallaciously built, right? Because what, what exactly are you getting from holding on to these objects other than that they say to you, we conquer this group of people across, you know, time and um, we're going to hold on to this as evidence that we did this. And um, the, the activist that I referenced, um, Diabanza, he, he traveled to these different museums across Europe and paid for museum admissions and, and still did this act of protesting. Yeah. And whereas, you know, most Africans do not have the same economic um, opportunities to go and even see this, this, the, these objects that their ancestors created. Mm. Um, and, and even from an African-American perspective, um, you know, I believe that most uh, African-Americans may be in better economic situations than most Africans and may have the financial means to go and travel to see these objects, which, which to me goes back to, and I also believe that the British Museum should return the, the Parthenon marbles. Like it just, I, I, I just don't, um, I, I, all of the rationales and the reasons given for holding on to those objects to me are um, really for lack of a better, more diplomatic term, BS. Like, just give it back. I mean, really. Like, and, and even these ideas about, well, you know, um, are you going to be able to preserve it and hold on to it for humanity? Well, 
it wasn't really intended for that in the first place in most cases, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. a lot of those objects were um, objects for the king and to like tell stories about the king and his family. And, and you took it and you made it, you, you decontextualized it and you made it something that it wasn't even intended for in its first like incarnation. So, um, so yeah, I, I just, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about about this and my mm -hmm. uh, my colleague Kamal, you know, may have more to add on the topic. Kamal? Uh, hello, thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Kyler. Um, you know, during this research, I found out a lot about how important African artifacts, regardless of their original context, how important they were in France in particular for the development of uh, certain schools of uh, surrealist school of art, um, the avant-garde hev was heavily influenced by these African cultural objects. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, they've been ripped from their original context, you know, we talk about restitution as a way to reconstitute or recover their original cultural meaning. We know societies change over time, but when we look at how, you know, France has viewed these objects as, as curios um, and then also as inspiration for um, cultural revival in the wake of World War I. We really have to see that African objects in a way have become a part of, of French art criticism of the French art canon in a way as antecedents. And so I think that that may explain partly why there's such a resistance to returning these objects which have inspired some of the world's greatest artists in the 20th century and whom you know there are several of whom weren't directly connected to their the violent uprooting of these objects but when you look at the history of like uh dealers like paul guillaume uh you know he initially worked as a as a mechanic and he would receive shipments of these African artifacts packed in with rubber, which we know was violently extracted from these plantations. So these contexts of, of the violent extraction and you know, yet they were, you know, some people looked at them as something that can transcend as they talk in the SARS of War report, the brute geopolitics of it all. But can you really transcend these very violent histories? Can the beauty of art, um, you know, essentially make up for the decontextualization of these objects that were often ritual or dynastic or uh, aristocratic in nature. And, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the nature of how do you convert an object? Is it ethical once you know that the object's purpose was for some different reason? Mm -hmm. Is it ethical to continue to treat it as art? Mm -hmm. um, or should it be returned to its proper place? Even if that society itself may ha has changed and may not be with the same, it's a part of their um, history. It's a part of the evolution of their um, heritage as even a nation or on the sub-national sub level. Mm. Fascinating. I just find this an absolutely, you know, a very primary and fascinating element. But let me let other some others into the converse, their conversation. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Smith and Bryson uh, this question about what about art-based diplomacy outside of museums? Is, uh, is there a role for that in the sense of, is Banksy a cultural diplomat? And what about objects with difficult provenance that's uh, 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 a way of being uh, global as well. But tell people like Banksy or the gentleman that was discussed uh, earlier, uh, who is semi stealing objects, not really, but making a performance art out of, I'm taking this and I'm going to go back and always being turned around. Uh, so he has to put the object back or it's, it's taken away. I just think, you know, this maverick outlaw kind of art is outside of diplomatic niceness, you know, uh, tradition. So how, do you, how would you respond to that? 
Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I think uh, it's it is very important, of course, that we turn our attention to outside of the museum sphere, right? Museums are only a tiny part of this conversation on cultural diplomacy that we want to have. Uh, and that's something that Jeff and I have been really engaged in with NACTI because we do feel that uh, artists and activists and a lot of other practitioners, if we're understanding practitioner as a term that's quite broad, um, are part of cultural diplomacy, are active contributors, uh, both for better and worse to this. So I think you could certainly make a case for Banksy or any other contemporary artist um, doing all kinds of interventions as a cultural diplomat. But what I think is interesting is that there is these these works might fall outside of a museum. The state may still lay claim to them in some ways or not. And I can just think of perhaps a Canadian example is a uh, contemporary artist, Kent Monkman, who does really, um, really interesting history paintings that are very critical of Canada's colonial origins. Um, and they may be shown in private galleries. Uh, they may be shown in a museum. They've certainly also been uh, shown, uh, you know, at cultural centers, you know, representing the state abroad. So I, what I find interesting about these types of artworks is, you know, the artist has their intention. They might be trying to do something with them, but uh, other institutions or players may also lay claim uh, to that message or try to co-opt it. Jeff, though, I'm sure you have stuff to add. I'll, I'll stop uh, it's, there. It's funny. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, contribute to Sarah's answer to that by uh, referring to some work that Sarah's done with another research partner of, of ours, uh, Linda Jessup, uh, both art historians by trade, and addressing this idea about, about how artists uh, can subvert and uh, concert, convert, uh, can challenge harder harder power politics, but the uh, the sense that they that this can actually work both ways. I mean, artists don't. I, th I think Kamal, when you talked about an art collector and and the idea of art sort of rising above the day to day uh, tensions of the world and worse, uh, you know, uh, outright hostilities and violence and murder. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not so sure that art artists do that, and I'm, I'm sure that high art doesn't do that, that, that it doesn't make us forget or bring us together um, over thing, uh, histories that are really, um, you know, diabolically bad. And uh, so I, I think, I think, you know, artists and, and uh, the fine world of fine art has a role to play and it plays outside of the institutions, but it's it's often vitalized and, and, and frankly appropriated by states and, uh, and other powers, uh, private powers. I work a lot on philanthropy and, uh, you know, art has been mobilized in many ways, good and bad to bring people together, but also to push them apart. So I, I guess that's my contribution to that answer a little bit. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting issue when you're working outside the framework of diplomacy, how whether they're not, it's a non-state or state, and still you're on the outside, and yet doing something and getting, getting a, away with it by actually uh, uh, re, re, redirecting buildings towards the art that you've placed on them. And, and not necessarily the history or connecting them. I mean, really being curators in a sense of history or recurating history in a way that I find really interesting for ordinary people walking by, you know, for people that are yeah. walking by. That I think is really tool. And that re reminds me of the question I wanted to ask Maria. Um, one longstanding museum issue has been who comes to see art exhibitions? And often it's the middle and the upper classes, right? Um, who attended your exhibitions, especially the one featuring working class Spaniards uh, in the United States in the 19th and 20th century diaspora? Are ordinary people in the cultural diplomatic link of these, these terrific, terrific exhibitions? I mean, I love to go to them, but I also know people who won't walk in, who will not, working class friends of mine who will not walk into a museum uh, because they don't, they think they have to act a certain way or you have to know a certain thing. So it's interesting. I'd like to know if the working class came to your <laughs> exhibition. 
Um, yeah, actually, uh, that was something that even though we could not, as I mentioned before, measure because we were only registering, but we were not sharing any uh, any paper afterwards or any query after the exhibition, uh, there were two ideas that gave us uh, a good approach of who was uh, visiting the exhibition in Madrid. Uh, first, with the personal, the people that was working there, because we were, they were very close to the visitors and they shared with us a lot of stories, but when I mean a lot, a lot, like daily stories, about people visiting and sharing with them stories. And also because one of the creators was living at the time in Madrid and was stepping on the exhibition almost uh, every day uh, or uh, just cruising around because he was having the same question as you were mentioning, who is gonna come to visit us? We made this story to acknowledge, to give light to an untold story of workers of working class people very in, in a very struggling conditions that they made their the worth life uh, flying to this, not flying, just uh, moving to, to, to the States uh, in search of a better life. Who is gonna come and visit? Only descendants, only people interested in history. And we realized that there were many visitors that they had no idea what they were going to see. And they were really shocked about the pictures about the uh, about the photographs because they were feeling they were there uh the uh, sense of being part of the history uh like i have a picture of this of my grandparents they were not uh, emigrating to the state they emigrate to a different country but i feel them i can feel the history i can feel this family i, I can feel this story of immigration myself so this feeling of of um of sharing values uh, that really make us uh, realize that the purpose of the exhibition was a success because we want to move empathy, empathy uh, uh, towards um, immigration. Of course, we wanted to focus because that's why uh, the foundation is there. And also because of the uh, curators were focusing on Spanish immigration. But in the end, this is part of a wider discussion about all of us, Spain is an immigration, typical immigration country, and we are forgetting that. And uh, with uh, uh, an exhibition like that, we wanted to share this untold story, but at the same time, we wanted to tell everyone, come and see who we were just less than a century ago, because you might feel you're part of that. And that's what it happens because many, many people came and realized I had no idea one, we were part of the immigration to the United States. And second, I didn't realize that the, that the, the, the tour, the typical tour that an immigration did, that this is what the exhibition relates, could be also the story of my family. So I filled them. And, and, and a lot of people from uh, middle class and, and, and any other class was visiting the exhibition. And, and also um, how it was prepared and made easy for everyone to access. It was not an academic view of immigration, which is absolutely respectful. And there were many others in many other parts of Spain, you know, immigration is such, a, such an issue and there have been many other exhibitions. But here we were focusing on the materials that uh, the curators found on the descendant house, houses. They were sharing with them. Mm -hmm. So for many people it was like, they're giving us the opportunity to share our history here in the state. We thought we were, the, we were unique and none. We are part of a diaspora probably smaller, not probably, it's smaller than uh, the Italian or, or the Irish diaspora or many other, or even the Spaniards in Argentina, for instance, but we were there and we were giving them a voice to share their history, both here in Spain and also in the States. So we think that it was open, both in the uh, content and also in the display, we were offering an opportunity for everyone to visit the exhibition and, and, and be, 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 be part of it. That, that was our main focus when we designed it. Oh, well, thank you, Maria. That's, that's interesting. That's obviously a kind of a point that I find an interesting point is always who goes. Um, when I was studying for that book, when I was studying the British Museum again, there was another brouhaha that was around a, a very small Raphael painting called Madonna of the Pinks that the Getty was trying to buy from it. 
<laughs> and the British government was just all upset and the, and the British Museum that, that, that you'd lose this, this little painting. They had, they had uh, 10 others, but never mind. Um, so they tried to, to show that actually this is a, a beloved piece of work in Britain. And so they brought people in from neighborhoods that really would, had never been to the National Art Museum of, in London and to women, women, they went and brought in women from, from communities that were very different than the museum going communities. Uh, in order to say, well, you see, women can identify with the Madonna, the pink soul. It was a really strange uh, kind of thing, you know, where you're, <laughs> where you're, you're trying to actually persuade people to, to like to like something that, in fact, is, is a very narrow middle class, upper class kind of understanding of art. So mm -hmm. I find all of this and uh, who attends and who's, who's a maverick, uh, really very interesting. And now I would like to ask if there are other people who would like to uh, raise a question here. I don't know how I do that actually. Uh, I don't see any hands or- any... Probably under participants. Oh, under participants. I, okay. Oh, maybe not. I'm sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> oh, no? let's see. No, no. Uh, raised hands, no raised hands. All right, that's fine. Let us continue to talk. We have 10 more minutes, though, if you have uh, some points you want to make to each other, really, about the work that you're listening to. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of, to get back to Maria, I'm really interested in, in right from the start when you talked about the what you call lesser known uh, history is what disciplinary historians call, and I'm sure you know this, is social history. And it, and people do really, really engage, and it makes sense. And it, it seems, you know, if artists can't save the world, I would think social history of working class immigrants might be able to <laughs> not save the world, but go a long way in terms of creating sort of understandings uh, cross nation and cross culture, mm -hmm. uh, because these are people that actually moved. And the reason I mentioned that is, uh, one of the museums of our study, uh, Pier 21, which is the Canadian Museum of Immigration, uh, we were very lucky. Our best graduate student, a brilliant guy, uh, took this on, and he's a very, very good social historian. And he told us all kinds of things about this museum and the oral history projects and how really fascinated uh, Eastern Canadians were, but also uh, populations from other places because they, uh, it was a story of migration, a story of the immigrant experience, a story of being part of a diasporic population, even if it wasn't a mm. diasporic population. It intrinsically, the type of, of, of uh, material that they were dealing with and the exhibitions they were running were, uh, you know, intrinsically, I won't say global, um, although that would be the attempt, but but in ter but very, very cross-cultural it, it, and, and really much more interesting, I think, as uh, Chris, Dr. Sylvester said, um, really speaks to a much broader audience than, than high art and, and which, which speaks, uh, I would assume, to a, a narrow swath of the population. Yeah, actually, it was interesting to, to realize that this um, generalization of what immigration was uh, has happened also inside Spain, because we have um, many institutions and museums and scholars working on very specific immigration groups. So from Galicia, from Asturias, from the Basque country, very well documented. But even though there are there are some uh, some uh, research, uh, we think we have launched the very first exhibition that is speaking about Spaniards in the U.S. and how we got to this title, to this generalistic title. Um, the the, um, the creators, they have been uh, during more than 10 years, almost 12 years, touring um, houses in the States, dozens, hundreds of houses in the States, um, asking people just to share their rusty teens, their uh, albums, uh, that they were almost about to, 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 to disappear, sharing their, their history. Each of those families, they, they, they thought their family was unique and their historic, their, their history, their, their grandfather, their, their aunt was the only one that was experiencing that kind of immigration. After gathering all these stories together, they realized what they supposed in, in, in the first time, that that was the story of 
Spanish immigration. Uh, the uh, people from Galicia, of course, focus on, on some very particular places in the States. Uh, Asturias, the same. Um, from Basque Country, the same. But in the end, their story was very similar. And that was something pretty new to realize here in Spain, that they were sharing a history and they were turning Spaniards there in the States. When they moved to the States, they were feeling closer to a wider community just because they were coming from the same place. But when they moved from Spain, they were just uh, from Asturias or from Galicia or from Andalusia and they realized they were sharing the same problems, the same stories, they did the same tour, they established in the same places. So uh, for us, the reivindication of this title, Spaniards in the US, was an, an statement in itself saying, we have realized from, from this uh, investigation that many, many, many of these Sp Spaniards share a history and they didn't even know. They didn't know there, when, when the curators gathered the information, but we didn't know either here in Spain. That's why the, the exhibition is divided in six uh, chapters, which represent uh, what any other immigrant could have done, the arrival, uh, how they started to work, how they started to establish, how cooperate, and then when they establish finally, and they never return because of the uh, global situation on what and what happened in Spain uh, due to the uh, civil war. So they were uh, walking on very similar paths and they didn't even realize uh, after many, uh, many years later, when we put together all, all the pieces of this puzzle. So for, for us, it was, it was uh, very representative of what can happen with immigration. You don't even realize that you're part of it until you have perspective. And that's what we wanted to, to give. And, and also for, for us at the, at the Fundación was, was a good new point to open towards other uh, historical issues we have been uh, treating. Because as you were saying, Jeffrey, immigration has been so important in every other country in the world and for Europe as well. All right. Well, perfect timing, I must say. <laughs> uh, 34 seconds left. Let me thank you very much uh, for a very interesting set of papers uh, that I enjoyed reading and talking about and meeting all of you. Um, and I hope to see you again in some of our uh, intersecting interests. Thank you very much. Have a good day. The rest of your Thank day. you, Dr. Sylvester. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Sylvester, for leading such a fascinating discussion. I'd now like to welcome to moderate our third panel, Mr. Brett Bobley of the National Endowment for Humanities, uh, who spearheads all of their technology and digital initiatives uh, he really has been a pioneer uh, in developing uh, the application of technology in the work of the National Endowment for the Humanities and has also been awarded by President Barack Obama for his efforts in that regard in making the role of the CIO uh, more efficient. And we're delighted that he could uh, join us here today to offer his perspective on behalf of the endowment. Thank you, Brett. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, indeed, I'm Brett. I'm with the National Endowment. I'm coming from Washington, D.C. And um, I founded the Office of Digital Humanities at the NEH about 15 years ago. And uh, the, I'm excited about today's panel because uh, the projects we'll be talking about today are the, the kinds of projects I, I often fund um, at the NEH. So why don't we go ahead and jump right into things. Um, today's panel theme is indeed digital humanities and this panel explores how the digital public humanities are transforming the way scholars approach interpret and communicate within the humanities field we will have three scholars today doing papers um, the first person let me introduce her is dr natalia grincheva uh, an internationally recognized expert in innovative forms and global trends in contemporary museology digital diplomacy and international cultural relations her publication profile includes over 30 research articles, book chapters, and reports published in prominent academic outlets. Her most recent publications are two monographs, Museum Diplomacy in the Digital Age and Global Trends in Museum Diplomacy. Dr. Grincheva's paper, 
titled Reviving Cultural Relations in the Post-Pandemic World, Employing Geovisualization and AI to Leverage and Augment the Cultural Appeal of Museums, will explore the potential of two cutting-edge digital approaches, geovisualization and AI, for mapping, assessing, and augmenting the digital soft power of museums in the post-pandemic reality. Let me go ahead and kick it over to Dr. Grincheva. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really delighted to be a part of this symposium. Thank you very much for bringing me to be a part of this uh, amazing team. I was so happy to see Sarah, uh, Antonio, and uh, I missed very much Professor <laughs> Sylvester. So it was amazing papers. I attentively listened to all of these uh, research developments, and this is great. I'm happy also to contribute to this discussion. So. Um, uh, the impact of COVID-19 global outbreak on the cultural sector has been devastating. The pandemic disrupted the international programs and long-term strategic plans of many museums, including their traveling exhibitions, object loans, international art residences, and commissioned work from artists abroad. Due to the economic crisis and the financial instabilities, institutional resources are understandably scarce. And museums, especially those operating internationally, require new methodological approaches for allocating and investing their resources so that they can deliver outcomes and maximize impacts in different geographic areas, depending on local challenges and opportunities. So my research drives attempts to address these issues and argues that geovisualization and machine learning can actually assist with the development of new methods, not only for measuring, but also for predicting soft power impacts of museums and their activities. So specifically, geovisualization, machine learning, and the artificial intelligence enabled solutions can assist cultural institutions to accurately evaluate the return value of their activities, make better use of their institutional resources and pursue more effective strategies for maximizing their cultural appeal and soft power reach in the post-pandemic environment. In my presentation today, I specifically focus on the practice-based research project developed in collaboration with the Australian Center for the Moon Image to create a first-in-the-world dynamic web application that can measure and map museum soft power. Uh, having suits in the State Film Center, ACME, my partner in this research project, was founded in 2002 to house the nation's largest collection of moving image documents ranging from films to digital arts and installations. Being a partner on this project, the ACME had been very helpful because it provided a lot of data about its collections, about its uh, international connections, about uh, its uh, visitation numbers in different geographic locations uh, to uh, develop the tool uh, of measuring museum soft power. So the project employed geovisualization, data mining, and digital storytelling to uh, develop this mapping solution, a mapping application that can demonstrate uh, museum global influence across five key layers of soft power from mere resources to social outputs and to finally to local outcomes, cultural and both economic. Uh, before I proceed with my presentation, let me just step back a little bit to clarify the background information about the project. So first of all, what exactly does this map aim to measure and visualize? Uh, what is soft power in the first instance? So soft power, and uh, I think uh, the majority of our audience would know anyway, is the term first coined by American professor of international relations, Joseph Nye, to describe the ability of a country to influence behavior of others through persuasion, attraction, and agenda setting. A country on the international stage can achieve influence by building networks, communicating compelling narratives, establishing international rules, and drawing on the resources that make a country nationally, uh, naturally attractive to the world. A nation soft power is increasingly subject to measurement with Portland Soft Power 40 uh, and a Global Power City Index reports providing evidence of this trend. These initiatives have generated a series of global indicators based on culture, education, science, uh, politics, and economy to annually assess the extent to which nations have risen through or declined upon these indices. 
So challenging these attempts to measure soft power, my research uh, reconfigures this framework of soft power evaluations by stressing three important points that have been overlooked in the previous research. So first, I combine various methods of soft power evaluation that previously were used separately. And these approaches include resources, outputs, outcomes, perceptions, and networks evaluation models. Uh, through my research, I developed a new integrative approach that can comprehensively combine different methods to construct a more advanced tool to measure soft power. Furthermore, I employ the cause-effect model to frame various approaches of soft power evaluation. Because uh, in order to assess soft power, on the one hand, it is necessary to evaluate agents, resources, capabilities, and behaviors. On the other hand, though, the assessment should include analysis of perceptions, affections, and responses of subjects. So second, I argue that previously proposed evaluation approaches could be improved through uh, mapping or geovisualization. Uh, so it is not really productive to measure soft power in general terms, assuming that the power appeal of a particular country or actor is the same in different geographic locations. Instead, I employ cultural analytics and city statistics of a specific location and look at secondary factors, for example, cultural diversity and vibrancy, local language and religion, to evaluate the soft power appeal to people living in this particular area, not in general terms. So finally, I argue that measuring soft power of a whole country is misleading, since these evaluations don't take into consideration the multifaceted and complex nature of different and very often competing actors within the country who generate and exert different degrees of soft power upon global publics. Uh, instead, I focus on museums as important actors in the international arena, which have their distinctive identities, brands, audiences, and followers. So in the era of digital globalization, museums have transformed from publicly funded cultural heritage repositories to key actors of creative economy and new centers of soft power. And the global outbreak of COVID-19 virus has forced museums and galleries worldwide to reinforce their distributed nature. Museums increasingly operate as hybrid institutions existing between physical and virtual worlds, projecting their attraction power through new tools, including augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, mobile devices, and digital technologies. So the multi-layered mapping project aimed to produce a system that allows a user to assess and visualize the influence of ACME on several inter interconnected levels. It included mapping the museum collections, uh, digital and physical audiences, international network of institutional connections and partnerships, as well as local impacts of ACME touring exhibitions. Each of these layers in the system measures the attraction power in different countries by calculating a power index a weighted sum of several key normalized indicators based on specific data in correlation to social demographic variables for each country or city on the global map. So the scale from zero to 100 for each of these indices allows a comparison of different countries and in combination with color coding, the system reveals geographic areas of missed opportunities and identify also zones of maximum influence. Uh, let me now go to the application and demonstrate how it works. So um, here's the uh, application, which is actually available online. Uh, there is a link that I can share with everybody to explore it later and to uh, play with this tool. Uh, so, uh, and as I said, it measures soft power of Australian set of the moon age on five layers. So let's start with the collection appeal power layer, uh, which actually demonstrates the potential appeal of ACME collection to attract audiences from different countries. So, uh, 
it correlates multiple sets of data that on the one hand uh, measures the linguistic diversity of films and uh, uh, Acme uh, collection has films in 49 different languages. It also kind of uh, demonstrates where the, the origin of this film, where they come from. And it's very interesting that because the 70% of Acme collections actually come uh, from uh, countries uh, beyond Australia. So, and it correlates uh, this type of uh, collection diversity data with the digital uh, and physical mobility of the population of each country to kind of expose the uh, discoverability potential of uh, this collection. So you can see with the intensity of the green that ACME collection actually uh, can potentially appeal to many countries, uh, including in North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. But this is very interesting. If you go to the next level, online engagement power, it actually shows where these audiences come from and how do they connect to ACME through different channels. And the intensity of the blue here indicates that uh, there are not so many uh, audiences online that connects with this uh, ACME collection. So most of them come from North America and Europe and uh, uh, Asia Pacific region uh, uh, stays relatively untapped. So this uh, data actually correlates online visitation data with social media engagement uh, and some other social media uh, channels. So uh, the interesting situation with China and Taiwan and uh, uh, Taiwan being a, a part of China, it has online engagement power uh, 33 which is pretty okay in comparison to other countries, and which is a really high in comparison to China, which uh, uh, is just zero, meaning that there are uh, th this uh, uh, there is a black hole in this mapping indicating that. Uh, uh, it, it is not possible to actually measure the online engagement of China because China is not so well connected through uh, all the channels that uh, ACME actually uses in order to outreach to international audiences. So uh, let me go to the next layer, which is global connectivity power layer, and it visualizes all the connections between ACME and 185 institutions around the world, uh, I think in around 80 different cities. So for example, if we go to Europe, uh, one of the most engaged countries uh, is Germany with global connectivity power uh, reaching 100. And you can see here how many different organizations in different cities in Germany are connected with ACME through different relationships. And uh, in each particular city, we can explore these connections further. We also try to measure uh, the strength and durability of these collections that actually range from very weak, uh, only just, you know, exchange kind of uh, connections and progressing to very strong uh, institutional and long-term partnerships. So let me now go to the next layer uh, that uh, actually measures uh, the traveling exhibition uh, impacts uh, of ACME around the world. In the last 15 years, it's toured different exhibitions to different countries. And uh, uh, in each particular case, we tried to measure this attraction power of this exhibition in this particular city by correlating three different sets of data, including the museum context, looking at global audiences and digital representation of the hosting museum space, looking also at urban context index and exploring the global exposure and cultural infrastructure of this particular city, and also looking at the attraction power the exhibition itself. Again, uh, we have multiple stories about all these exhibitions and what happened in each particular um, city. So uh, let me now go back to my slides and tell you a little bit more about um, um, another layer that uh, was launched most uh, recently. In May 2019, the Museums of Power Map application launched a new layer, the Local Engagement Power Forecast. It predicts the soft power of the most uh, recent ACME touring exhibition, Wonderland, that was exceptionally well received in Melbourne in 2018, inviting almost 200,000 on-site visitors. And this layer forecasts the attraction power of this 
travel and exhibition in potential hosting cities across continents. For example, among 17 potential cities where Wonderland might travel in the next decade from Los Angeles to Taipei, the prediction model of linear regression forecasted Singapore and Wellington and New Zealand to be among the most leading uh, receiving cities in the Asia Pacific with the local engagement power forecast indices reaching 59 and 78 respectively. So this forecast is based on the first iteration of input data collected from a series of uh, DreamWorks animation blockbuster exhibition that proved to be also highly successful in, among Asia Pacific audiences. And this exhibition traveled in the region in 2015 up to uh, 2017, and was hosted by a number of museums, including the Art Science Museum in Singapore, the Papa Museum in New Zealand, and Seoul Museum of Art in South Korea. So the Wonderland's actual visitation numbers recently collected from Art Science and the Papa Museums, in fact, through that forecast calculations uh, to be quite accurate. And the second iteration input information uh, provided uh, valuable data to feed the local attraction forecast machine learning algorithm that will obtain a high degree of precision once Wonderland and other future exhibitions of Park Mevo travel to other cities across the globe, generating different attraction power in different locations to supply more input data. In conclusion, I wanted to share that based on this pilot project, I'm currently working in collaboration with the Digital Diplomacy Research Center at the University of Oxford on the new project that aims to advance this cultural mapping and artificially intelligent enabled solutions. And the new research project in partnerships with several actual museums from three cities, London, Melbourne, and Singapore will commence in September this year, and it will draw on the critical digital practice methodology to experiment with existing data collected from participating museums to prototype new solutions, more advanced solutions for assessing and predicting soft power museums, including by harnessing the power of artificial intelligence to identify and predict patterns of digital cultural engagement. So I'm happy to answer all your questions and please feel free to connect if you would like to continue a discussion beyond the space. But uh, again, it was a pleasure to be a part of this uh, uh, symposium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Grincheva. Really appreciate it. That was a terrific presentation. Um, I did. I did have a question. Um, you know, I, I actually have a, a grant program. It's a joint program with the UK government, and it's very much in this area. It's um, it's funding cultural analytics based research projects at museums and galleries and other cultural institutions. And one of the things that we have noticed, um, certainly in the UK and the US, is that while there are some museums that are very digitally savvy, they collect a lot of data, they know how to use it, and they have staff that understand how to use it, there's also a lot of museums that don't play in that space at all. Now, I was curious, I guess it's sort of a two-part question, from your experience in Australia and other places, is that the case kind of globally or are museums a little bit more digitally savvy in Australia? And I guess part B, um, when a museum doesn't have that expertise, can they still take advantage of, um, of, your, of your software or are there other steps they need to take in order to get there? Uh, thank you so much, Brad. This is a really interesting question. And actually, I received a similar questions many times when I presented this research. So yes, indeed, our, uh, the situation, the first <laughs> answer to your question, the situation is global. It's just everywhere. There are uh, museums who are more digitally savvy, who are uh, always ready, who are innovative, that uh, goes forward uh, with a step by step with their development uh, and innovations. And there are museums uh, that are not so fast in this domain and uh, remain in the shadow when it concerns digital communication and digital engagement. So uh, yes, uh, again, it depends uh, in many cases on their uh, budget of these institutions uh, uh, and their, uh, how significant how major how large these institutions how uh, you know well funded uh, they are rather by public or private funds uh, uh, so yeah it, it depends on the institutional capacity to actually 
you know, engage with uh, digital tools because uh, it's expensive. <laughs> it's not that easy. It requires uh, human resources. It requires expertise. It, it requires uh, a, a lot of actually time because even to digitize the collection, it takes decades. For, depending on the collection so it, it requires a lot of resources good funding and the uh, right experts who can lead this right, because right. it takes a lot of human efforts to push this agenda forward in each institutions considering how bureaucratic these institutions might be especially if they're big institutions and if they are uh, publicly funded or funded by the governments. So yes, indeed, in order to get advantage of the software that I am developing, uh, yes, of course, the <laughs> certain steps <laughs> are needed yeah. to be taken because uh, uh, the system is actually designed to aggregate, automatically aggregate data. Because uh, in order for me, for example, to collect all the data uh, manually, it would take me, you know, years, you know. So uh, instead of that, the system actually aggregates the data that already exists, that already uh, was harnessed, uh, collected, you know, stored by the institution itself. And it just, you know, transform it into a digital storytelling kind of tool to demonstrate uh, what this data is about, how we can use this data to... Uh, you know, maximize uh, uh, our potentials in different uh, uh, locations around the world. So, yeah, because when I started to go with this application uh, with these different demos in different countries, I've got a lot of requests. Oh, please, can, can, can you come to our institution and, and do a similar thing? Uh, and then, like, when I realized that there is no, uh, you know, channels through which I can aggregate the data or there is no digital collection or no digital uh, catalog of the collection or uh, the institution doesn't have any records going back in terms of their visitation numbers or ticket sales then it's a problem then it's a problem then it first needs to be digitized and you know <laughs> stored properly and saved and and then moved forward to another Got level it. That makes perfect sense. It, it's definitely uh, agrees with what we've seen in the, here in the US and what I've learned from the UK as well. So thank you very much. I think we're just about out of time. So thank you so much. And, and, and I know that you're calling from Australia. So it's very, very late where you are. So I, 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 I appreciate it very much. That you could participate and it was a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brad, and uh, thank you again uh, for uh, the organizers of this symposium. It's amazing and it's timely, it's uh, needed, and I had a blast uh, listening to all the papers and seeing some familiar faces. <laughs> bye bye. So <laughs> have a good day. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, terrific. Um, our next paper is going to be from Casey Haddock. Uh, Casey Haddock is an archaeologist and received a master's degree in world heritage and cultural projects for development from the University of Turin. Haddock is currently the Director of Conservation Programs at SciArc, a nonprofit organization dedicated to digitally preserving cultural heritage. His paper, titled Online Training in 3D Documentation and Storytelling, reflects on a 2020 collaboration between SciArc, Story Center, the English Language Program at the US Embassy in Amman, and Madaba Regional Archaeological Museum Project that provided online workshops to local stakeholders in Madaba, Jordan. Um, Casey Haddock, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, I'm really excited to be here and contribute and, and learn, uh, learn so much from all these amazing colleagues. So thank you very much. Um, like you mentioned, um, today I'll be talking about a really exciting project that I, I had the privilege of working on. And as you mentioned, a few of the stakeholders, there were a lot. And I think that's one of the beauties of of the pandemic, if there can be anything good, is that it's allowed us to engage with a lot more stakeholders than we've typically um, worked with in the past. And um, and like you said, I'll be um, talking about this project, um, which which um, reflected a collaboration between Jordanian and American professionals, um, which was launched just a few months ago. Um, that took place most of the work during during the pandemic. So, um, go ahead and transition. Um, and so this project was funded by the Cultural Antiquities Task Force from the US Department of State. 
So before I jump into the project, I want to provide a little background about SIRC, um, the nonprofit organization that I work for. We are based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and but we work globally for the preservation of cultural heritage. And so SIRC uses digital tools like laser scanning and photogrammetry to generate these really incredibly um, dense um, 3D models of heritage sites. And so this data um, can be used to support the protection of these places, but also can serve as the basis for creating these place-based experiences. And so since the pandemic, like Dr. Grincheva was mentioning, we've been helping sites and cultural institutions make this transition to the digital space um, using some of the methodologies we've developed. Um, and so you can see there's there's three main areas where we work, this interpretation and education, where we whereby we use 3D models and other immersive media to raise awareness or educate the public. Um, these accurate 3D models can be combined with audio or video, um, and they can be used to tell a story. And we've developed a number of virtual reality experiences, including um, a prototype experience funded by the NEH, um, that provide virtual access to places and can be used um, as a canvas for telling telling stories and sometimes stories that, that are not often told at these places. The second area that we work is the conservation and management. Again, this is where the majority of my work takes place. So these same 3D models that can be used to educate the public can also be used to map or monitor damage or understand problems. A lot of the places that we work at are affected by climate change. And so this high resolution 3D data um, of every surface of these monuments empowers local site managers with quantifiable data that they can use to make decisions and plan restoration efforts. And the final area that we work is in open access. And so um, SIRC strives to share all the data that we collect um, freely. Um, and so we support this through publishing our data with Creative Commons licensings, which supports academic and artistic reuse. Um, and so like with many of our projects at SIRC, um, the project in Madaba, Jordan, uh, that I'll be talking about today, involved working in all three of these areas where SIRC works. Um, so since our founding in 2003, SIRC has documented um, or provided training in our methods at over 250 sites around the world. Uh, we often collaborate with local ministries of culture and U.S. embassies and consulates around the world, um, which has typically been accomplished through in-person expeditions that last from anywhere from one to four weeks. Um, however, since the pandemic, um, SIRC has been working a lot more virtually. And so we've been um, accomplishing our, our mission through virtual trainings in our methods um, and, uh, and virtual workshops in, in, in different, um, different aspects of the work that we complete. Uh, so these online experiences, we, we've developed an online platform called 3D Virtual Tours um, that we uh, that allow site managers um, and communities to use these to these experiences online to provide access um, to these places that many of them have been closed during the pandemic. Um, and so the one place mini stories project in Manaba was an example uh, of one of these programs. Uh, and it was designed to support the, the community of Madaba, which is is a, a site located in, in south of the capital of Amman which was devastated, like many communities, by the loss of tourism from the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this project involved partnering with a number of Jordanian and American organizations to identify local participants and then to provide training uh, in order to develop this, this virtual experience. Um, and the city of Madaba is, is located, like I said, southwest of Amman, and it's, it's one of these cities that is famous for um, Byzantine a number of Byzantine period mosaics. And so it is also one of the, the home to uh, the oldest known mosaic of the Holy Land. And uh, there's a number of historic sites. The, the Department of uh, State is working on supporting uh, the development of a new museum in the city of Madaba. And so this community is really um, well positioned to, to undertake a project to provide virtual access to some of these places. Um, so one of the principal components of the One Place Mini Stories project that I'll be sharing today was a virtual workshop in SIRC's methods. Um, and so we identified together with our local partners a group at the, universe, the American University of Madaba, the Faculty of Architecture, 
And so in advance of this virtual workshop, participants were shipped an inexpensive kit, less than $1,700 in advance of the workshop, which mirrored Cyrix's own equipment that we use on our typical field projects. So this off the shelf kit uses a technology called photogrammetry which is a process that uses overlapping photos taken in a very regimented way to develop these really accurate 3D models. And so we're talking about many thousands of pictures taken um, all around in different corners of the site. And these are brought together in the software to generate the 3D models. And so the, the virtual workshop, we're not talking about weeks and weeks of workshop on this project. We, we provided instruction over four days and, and then following the, the workshop, the participants from the university were able to immediately apply what they learned to the documentation of three sites in the historic city or the, the central of downtown Madaba. Um, so like I mentioned, local participants took thousands of photos all around these places um, and then shared that data back with us through the power of um, uh, file transfer file transfer software and so we could review that data make sure that all of the areas were captured and then provide any feedback in advance of the next day's work um, and so um, like i mentioned i think the the, the participants took around ten thousand photographs of these three locations this uh, saint george church which is the location where the this incredible mosaic of the holy land um, all written in Greek is found, as well as two other important sites, another historic church, um, which is famous for uh, mosaics um, depicting some of the Greek myths, um, and, as well as um, uh, a palatial residence. And so, so the, the university participants and um, we're not the only people people from Ottawa that received a workshop. We also partnered with Story Centered, like Brett mentioned, which is another nonprofit organization here in the Bay Area um, that provides workshops on, on storytelling. And so with Story Center, we worked with six community members to record personal memories of, of these historic sites. And um, they may be beautiful to look at for us, but um, through, through these stories, we were able to hear on why these places are so important to the local community. And so um, from stories uh, about how um, people used to play on those mosaics growing up um, all the way to the present day. And so again, through this project, we were trying to, to collect and record the, these stories to, to provide a platform to tell the perspective from someone from Madaba about these places. And so again, all of these stories were, were recorded in Arabic and English so that we could have dual language versions of the final experience. Um, and then in addition to the community members, we also worked with uh, tour guides. So a number of tour guides of Madaba who typically take tourists um, to the city on in-person visits to these historic places. We were able to record them through video conferencing, kind of giving us a tour of these three historic sites um, as if we were there in person. And again, um, as with the community members, we recorded them both in Arabic and English, um, providing narration, also connecting with the place. I think this church that we're seeing here, this is showing the, the mosaic map on the floor, but this was actually one of the locations where one of the tour guides was married. It was the same church. And so again, telling these stories of why this place is so important. Um, and then um, together we were able to um, combine all of that audio and video collected from the tour guides and the community members to generate three um, uh, virtual tour experiences of these three sites. And so again, you see six here because we have both Arabic and English language versions. Um, but these these tours take take you through Madaba um, with with a with a local providing the the narration on on what you're seeing and you can you can either explore on your own or kind of engage with the media that the, the tour guides and community members share with you. And so I just have a, a, a quick kind of video to show a little bit of what, what that looks like. Um, see if it's gonna load for me. Um, and now let's go inside the St. George Church to really see what makes this church special and unique. Once so we enter inside the church, just to our right on the floor, over. we can see a remarkable mosaic. 
It's a beautiful. Jump to the next slide. Yeah, so in this experience, we have the tour guide kind of narrating what you're seeing of the mosaic floors. And again, in this map, you see all of the principal historic sites in Madaba and then throughout um, the other cities in, in the region. Um, you even have Jerusalem. And so these this audio and video were brought together in this platform that is embeddable on, on partner websites as well. And so um, the beauty of, of having all of these partners on this project is that we could share the resulting experience through these different platforms. Um, and so uh, we, as you can see, the results are, are truly incredible. I think the, the participants from the American University of Madaba took what they learned and over that four days, and they were able to generate these incredible 3D models of these places that really um, kind of provide that sense of place, um, which is augmented by the audio and video um, from the tour guides and community members. And so you really um, are able to see, again, the, the, the university participants took four days to document these places, taking around 10,000 photos. And so in, in just eight days, we, we have these results that we're able to share with the public in this final experience. And so in addition to this kind of dynamic educational experience that can be embedded um, on, on Cyrix website as well as partner websites, um, we were also able to share the data um, that was collected uh, on our um, Open Heritage 3D, which is a, a repository for cultural heritage data. And so again, uh, the idea with this publication is that that this data can live on beside, beyond this project. I think these, these images and 3D data may have use in the future because it provides a really accurate, comprehensive um, model or point in time record of this place. And so um, again, each of these data sets from these three locations was assigned a, a digital object identifier and, and you can um, download this data free of charge and, and reuse it and remix it as you see fit. Um, so I think, again, partnering with the Cultural Antiquities Task Force, this experience, we, we wanted to really explain how, how these cultural heritage sites um, are, why are there the multi-layered benefits that they provide to the community. And I think this was really exciting to, to SIARC because we saw the, the ability to, to provide training um, to our partners abroad and, and getting really incredible results um, in just a short amount of time. And so we've been able to replicate this with several other um, uh, consulates and around the world and so um, this has been an exciting way that we can not only provide virtual access through through a, a, a virtual workshop on 3d documentation but we can also as well strengthen local communities with these exchanges of skills and and then in the final experience promote the protection and respect for these places um, by, by kind of in, including all of those different levels of meaning and importance that these places share to local communities. Um, yeah, um, I think that's, yeah, and I encourage you all, I kind of am wrapping it up um, to experience the, the, the site for yourself on, I've included the link here. Um, you can go through each of the experiences in Arabic and English and, and kind of engage with the different pieces of media, um, watch the videos and, and learn about all the different ways that, that Madaba is important to the local community. Thanks so much. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Casey. We appreciate it. That was a terrific presentation. What we're gonna do now, we're gonna jump right into our third presentation. And then when that's over, we'll loop back and we'll do some Q&A for the last two presentations. So let me go ahead now and introduce our third speaker. Um, Hannah Wang is a co-founder of Gesso, a location-based audio platform for exploring cities and museums. Prior to launching Gesso, she has worked across the arts and social impact sectors at institutions such as Sotheby's, Phillips, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Smithsonian's Freer Gallery of Art and, Sackler, and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. Wang holds a Bachelor of Arts in Art History and Economics from Bucknell University and a Master of Science in Culture and Society from the London School of Economics. Her paper titled Exploring the Humanities Through Audio AR uses the case study of Paris in New York, a collaboration between Gesso and the cultural services of the Embassy of France to explore the way immersive audio technology adds another dimension to the digital humanities. Um, Hannah Wang, please go ahead with your presentation. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such an honor to be part of this prestigious panel. Um, today, uh, we're going to be talking about exploring the humanities through audio AR. Um, my name is Hannah Wong. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Gesso, as Brett has mentioned. Um, uh, before I dive in, um, you might be wondering, um, what is audio AR? You might have heard of VR, AR. Um, I'll get into that in a second. Um, secondly, I'll talk about the evolution of audio AR for storytelling as part of um, our team's experience, um, as well as I'll share um, some case studies that sort of support the, um, the, the, or illustrate the power and potential of this technology. And then lastly, um, I'll show you a few ways uh, that you can um, use to leverage uh, the technology that we've built so that your institutions uh, don't have to um, build the technology from scratch. Now, what is audio AR? Audio AR is um, essentially the overlaying of the physical world with a virtual layer of audio. And what that means is really location-based audio. Imagine walking around, uh, walking down the street and being able to hear um, the story of that building that you've always wondered about but never um, looked up, or um, really uh, hearing uh, an audio documentary or audio journalism delivered through your headphones as if it were a whisper, as if a good friend were showing, a re showing you around a gallery, um, a museum, uh, or, or city streets, uh, or if you're uh, on a road trip, um, being able to access stories uh, of the places as you're passing. And why does audio AR matter? And how does it further cultural diplomacy? Um, we've, uh, the, the word empathy has come up a lot uh, in today's panel, and really that is the foundation of what we do. Um, empathy is, a, is the foundation of mutual understanding and grassroots diplomacy. Really being able to hear about um, different people's experiences, we're realizing um, with the lack um, especially the racial reckoning happening here in the U.S. over the last year, that um, media is broken, um, that uh, are really these diverse stories need to be told and these diverse stories bind us. I'd love for you to think about a place that's important to you. And while you're doing that, um, I'll share a place that's important to me. Um, we're looking at the building, uh, the mid-century modern building uh, in the middle there. Um, what I can tell you about this, this is um, the Apollo Memorial Library, located 40 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. Um, and if you read the Wikipedia page or if you read the About Us page on, on the library's website, um, it might tell you that it was the first library that was built in the county in the late 1800s. The building you see today uh, was built in 1963. But what is not mentioned is um, in the early 2000s, the, the library was on the verge of shutdown. And um, my mother uh, grew up during the Cultural Revolution. Um, her schooling was interrupted at the age of seven until she was uh, 18. Um, and she self-taught, she uh, studied uh, in the libraries that were, um, that remained open, the limited reading rooms that were open throughout China. Um, and when she had an opportunity to come to the States to study in the early eighties, she, uh, no surprise, uh, studied library science and became a librarian. So this was where she had her first job. Um, and back to the thread on the library on the verge of shutdown in the early 2000s, my mother flew from Taiwan where we were living at the time to throw a fundraiser to save this library. And so in a way, these are the hidden stories that really inspire us, that, um, that are beneath the surface, that celebrate in the individuals who, who shape culture and continue to shape our heritage and legacy. This is a picture of her <laughs> uh, taken in the uh, early 80s. Um, and she's very much the reason why I started Gesso, because I realized that places and objects contain stories of people who shape culture. 
I wanted to give a little shout out to my teammates as well. Um, I'm the person on the, uh, the left there. Um, the person in the middle is Demetrio um, and the person on the right is Michael. Um, and we are three third cultural kids. Um, and the experience of moving around and adapting to different cultures uh, during our upbringing really um, brought us together. I found that the common thread of needing to adapt um, and um, forever be ob observers uh, in a new place um, made us nerds about uh, the, the layers of history that's tucked just beneath the surface. We're all about celebrating the wonder in the world through sound and we're ironically encouraged the pleasure of getting lost for the sake of knowledge. We map the world's art and history through spatial audio for the seekers and explorers. And in that, in the process, revealing beauty in the ordinary, um, connecting strangers who share more than they'd ever expect. Um, and we, we strive to be a catalyst for the discovery of culture. Um, we're really telling what we want to do with Gesso um, is being that foundational layer, that primer beneath it all, that unsung hero that um, creates the scaffolding so that to elevate other people's um, worldviews. Um, so for curious listeners near us and, and far, um, we're really telling the story of humanity through audio and um, in doing so creating a better society where we can thrive together. With that really grandiose uh, vision, um, we thought that technology should be a bridge and not a barrier. My co-founders are, are technologists and um, as Brett introduced, um, I'm a sociologist and, and, a, and an art historian. Um, and so the three of us, when we came together, initially we thought we could tackle um, inequality through museum tech because at the time uh, we started four years ago, um, Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, spent $100 million supporting only 15 museums in their digital engagement. Of course, Brett, your work um, through uh, NEH uh, has supported many more institutions in being able to engage and make their collections more accessible uh, and inclusive to the public. And where we thought we could come in is serving the 90% of museums that don't have access to resources of funding and um, enabling um, or in making this tool that could democratize storytelling available to institutions of all sizes. Um, and then we, um, we thought, of course, stories about places and culture, cultural experiences extend beyond the walls of museums. And so we started set, um, making podcasts that were about places. Um, here we interviewed the um, one of the co-founders of the High Line, um, where he recounts the his memory of first uh, stepping foot onto this abandoned rail yard here in New York. And it felt like a dream, like uh, a New Yorker where space is um, really precious, that uh, you had stumbled upon a hidden room that you didn't know existed before. Um, and then we thought, um, actually, what would be um, really powerful is being able to tell stories in context while you're out exploring. So um, during the pandemic, we uh, created 500 uh, one to two minute micro podcasts that are geotagged. Um, so as you're walking down the street, you can um, walk past uh, uh, Jean-Michel Jean Basquiat's old studio um, that is now a restaurant. Um, you can... Um, uh, go uh, visit the church where Patti Smith first stepped up to read her electric poetry, um, really tracing the birth of punk and uh, understanding or uh, kind of um, un unpacking what, what, it, what is hipsterism, what is the sociological look at um, the gentrification um, or the um, Soho effect um, that has uh, permeated throughout the world um, in urban centers. Um, and then we wanted to take it take audio AR even a step further. Um, Devin, do you mind playing this video? Revel in the seemingly unending field ahead. The mysticism at play in this pastoral paradise tucked between bustling neighborhoods. Perhaps take a moment and peek at whose loved ones are memorialized on tiny plaques at the bench corners. As the path begins to slope downhill, look right. 
That brick building across the meadow was the picnic house. A number of picnic shelters were built in the late 1800s as larger groups of 100 plus clamored to gather in the park. Thank you for that. Um, this is just a short demo of how our app works as you're um, discovering a landscape where we like to call these kinetic documentaries or sound blocks. And of course, the idea of sound blocks is not new. Um, there are artists um, dating back to the 70s um, through to the 90s uh, using evolving technologies like cassettes and um, CDs and uh, delivering these experiences through Walkman. Um, of course, now um, there are different technology platforms that you can leverage, uh, whether it's through podcasting channels or sound, um, uh, like SoundCloud or Spotify, but those uh, don't uh, aren't uh, location specific. And so we wanted to build something that really encouraged this, again, um, pleasure of getting lost. So if someone wanted to take a detour, um, the next segment won't play until they get there. Imagine uh, experiencing the world through uh, both nonfiction and fiction, um, a murder mystery that's set in place um, that has some historical re relevance um, is something that um, uh, our projects or examples that have pop popped up in this space uh, in the past. And so the result is a, um, that we built Gesso as a home for stories about place. Um, and where we, um, so that includes muse official museum guides, um, these self-guided walks or audio tours, um, and then these linear, really narrative, immersive uh, experiences as well. Um, and then I'll share a few case studies. Um, and as Brett mentioned, um, last year ahead of Bastille Day, um, when every, everything was virtual, um, we partnered with the, um, with the cultural services of the French Embassy, um, it's based in, here in New York, um, to celebrate the long-standing friendship between um, France and America uh, through uh, six stops that are here in New York, um, pardon me, I'm based in Brooklyn, so this is very New York-centric, um, but uh, anywhere from the Statue of Liberty to um, the uh, Iron Gates um, uh, at, the, um, uh, at the zoo, um, anywhere from an apartment building to um, a beloved bookstore. Um, so the, uh, the deputy cultural counselor narrated this uh, and uh, it continues to live on even those created last year. Um, and it's something that people can explore uh, on their own. Um, whether they want to, they prefer remotely or in person. Um, this is a group that we uh, recently collaborated with. They're um, Elmhurst Queens-based um, food activists who uh, wanted to shed light on um, the, the restaurants that are based in Queens and really celebrate them. Um, Elmhurst was an epicenter of the academic, many frontline workers who serve um, uh, who, who work in the service industry and health industry uh, live in Elmhurst. So they created this food crawl and, and fundraised um, for a local food pantry. Um, during the food crawl, crawl um, participants can also listen to, uh, to interviews with restaurant owners. Uh, we also had an um, artist and magician uh, based in Chicago who was commissioned by the MCA Chicago uh, created a, a set of invisible museums while the um, while MCA Chicago was closed to the public. This was something that people can do socially distance outdoors. Um, and then we also had a group of artists um, here in, um, in New York create a sound walk through Harlem. That was, um, according to the New York Times, a impressionistic audio response of a real to a real event of a, a deer, a one antler deer wandering through Harlem. For those of you who are surrounded by nature, this might not sound strange, but it certainly is um, in a concrete jungle, like where I am now. Um, and then as, we're, uh, as we were making our Brooklyn Bridge audio walk, um, protests broke out uh, last May um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. We were there and captured um, audio and were able to um, really focus on how this landmark not only is an engineering marvel, but 
what it means to the world in connecting ideas, be it protest, be it love, be it, um, be it intellect. Uh, I wanted to invite you to leverage our technology to tell stories as well. What's really important to us is the ability um, to offer our listeners an experience of, uh, or um, an opportunity for people to build empathy, to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And so we built a creator tool where um, you, can, you can leverage and Basically, you can drop a pin for, for if you're creating a location-based audio experience, audio walker, audio tour, you can drop a pin on a map, attach a, an image, attach an audio file, um, title it, and then string them together to make an audio, a linear audio tour that's thematic or a self-guided one where um, so much of the emphasis is uh, the exploration of the in-between as well. And then for cultural institutions, we have a, a, a a section of this admin where you can create a branded module for your institution that um, has your logo and um, color schemes as well. Um, and then many people, many of the uh, partners that we've worked with, um, of which we've um, we've worked with about 60 institutions now, um, are daunted by the process of uh, producing their audio uh, content and fret not, um, it really isn't that complicated. We have um, a four, really, a, it can be broken down to four steps. So working with curators or experts to write um, and then uh, we have resources and, and tips on how to record yourself um, and then how to really simple tools to edit. And then really lastly, um, testing and iterating and publishing our team is on hand to support with that process. Um, for example, the Queen's Museum was able to, let, or to um, incorporate archival audio that was taken from um, one of the World's Fairs um, about the panorama that is on view in their museum. And um, really most of the audio that was created with um, the educator's uh, iPhone uh, voice memos app. So this is totally possible. Um, many, uh, many audio guide providers out there um, I think really focus on the, um, the, a really lengthy um, production process that could cost anywhere from 10 to 100K. And um, this is um, in, in a sector where resources are really tight. Um, we'd like to offer a really smart way I think, um, for people to be able to do it themselves. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, there are um, there are resources um, on our website. You can visit www.jasso.app, that's spelled with a G. Um, and then you can also find us on the App Store. Uh, we're just getting started and of course would like to, um, to be uh, a place, a home for stories about places um, and invite you to come contribute. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much. Um, those were two terrific presentations we had there from, from both Casey and Hannah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw off a couple of questions out there. But if you have questions um, in the audience, please uh, send them in as well. Uh, I'm sure they would love to hear them and answer them. Um, let me go ahead and start with one for Casey. Um, Casey, when it comes to um, any kind of a sort of a 3D virtual recreation of a, of a, of a heritage site, seems like there's always some tension um, because, you know, I'll hear from some sites that say, I'm worried that if I make a great 3D site, tourists won't come in person anymore. They'll just watch the 3D. But on the other hand, I hear other sites say the opposite. They say, well, a good 3D site will encourage more tourists. Just from your perspective, what are you hearing out there in the world in, in, in 2021 um, from organizations that are thinking about doing a, a 3D cultural site of some sort? Yeah, I think that's something. Thank you, Brett. I think that's something that we've we've struggled with in the past, and and talking with sites and and making that that case. And and sometimes it is that 
sites were not interested in and participating in, in the past um, and having a virtual representation. Uh, I think even the, the highest fidelity 3D just pales into comparison with being there. I think it can get you close, but I think um, there, there's so much more, I think, um, like audio or, with, or, or the, the smells or the feelings that you, you get when you're there is something that is really difficult to replicate even in the most the technical, technically sophisticated virtual reality applications. But in the last, few, well, since the pandemic started, we, we've had at SciArc so much interest in, in utilizing historic data that maybe was captured previously for the purpose of conservation sites are how can we use this to provide virtual access to these places I think that's something that we've heard over and over again and I think now institutions maybe because they were forced to they're, they're having to think about um, what their digital strategy is going to be and I think that's something that's really exciting is we've been able to kind of take that data that was captured in the past maybe for a certain um, idea in mind, better to understand erosion or climate change impacts, and we could work with them and to develop some kind of virtual experience. And so that's something that we've been able to replicate in, I think, about 15, even just since the pandemic started, at 15 places, including sites here in the United States, like the National Park Service. We had partnered with them to do a study on Mesa Verde, which are these incredible cliff dwelling structures in Southern Colorado. And, and the site was really interested in how could we take that data that was captured for the purposes of better understanding cracking. How could we use that data to create something that they could use um, for their distance learning modules and something that they could use to provide virtual access to the spaces. And so we've we've seen a ton of interest in, in using all the way from VR to the, the most simple panoramic photos. And so that's something really exciting, being able to kind of leverage that existing data going forward. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, let me throw a question out to Henna as well. Um, I want to follow up on something you talked about a little bit toward the end of your presentation, which is how does Jessa work with your client? Um, as you noted, there, there certainly are a number of toolkits out there already for creating geotag tourism alike. Um, I don't know, I'm curious from your perspective, when you work with an organization, is it often the case that they try to do it themselves and they, they didn't, they, they were unsuccessful? Um, what, 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 what do you kind of bring to the table to help an organization that's never done it before create a successful tour or, 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 or AR experience? Uh, many people find it really daunting to create uh, digital engagement. Um, many of the uh, partners that we have uh, range, range from a one-person, uh, one-room museum uh, that's in a historic artist studio, like Pollock Krasner House, uh, all the way to um, mid-sized museums uh, like the International Center of Photography and Museum. And of course, based on each institution's bandwidth and resources that are available to them, we have different um, different recommendations as to uh, what, what their uh, capacity is. And so um, for the for a zero budget or shoestring budget, we have um, recommended equipment. Um, sometimes it's it's as I mentioned, an iPhone uh, or a smartphone recorder voice memo app um, to um, uh, sort of pro tools um, used by audio producers. Um, and of course, we, we have an audio production team on staff that we often um, can, can lend um, either expertise or um, actual uh, support in production. Oh, terrific. Um, and actually, that, that makes me think of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a similar question back to Casey, because you talked about the fact that there's a range of different tools, some more expensive, some less expensive, and there's different ones that, that different clients could use. Um, Casey, you, you, you touched on photogrammetry. Um, and I, you know, I, I remember I, I, I've, I've been funding um, kind of 3D virtual sites for almost 20 years. And, and back in the day, it was almost always using laser scanning, which was very expensive, difficult to do created very, very large data sets, which are difficult to process. But my impression is that photogrammetry has kind of changed the game, made it easier. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? How, is, how, how has it changed over the last, say, 10 or 15 years? 
Yeah, certainly. I think yeah, you're 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 correct. I think like laser scanners used to be the size of a small car, and um, they needed power, and it was very difficult to to buy one and for an institution to purchase one. And, and you're right, the resulting data sets were very difficult to manipulate. And I think Cyric, like since the very beginning, we've been around for around 20 years. We we've started using laser scanning, um, and so we've as the software has developed, I think that is really where the the, the changes that we've seen is with, with software. And so now you can take even photographs from an iPhone, um, put them into a software. Again, photographs taken in a very regimented way with photogrammetry. Again, you're, you're, you're moving your camera in a, in a regimented way around the object or the site, and then you're uploading that to a software. And I think, um, yeah, even, even five years ago when I started at SciArc, I, I've seen in the last five years like the software gets so much better at producing a, a, a good result in, in a much quicker turnaround. And so now you can you can throw in 10,000 images into a machine and, and kind of run that software for a couple hours and then you get a pretty amazing result. And I think, again, there were, there were challenges and roadblocks with the software in, in, in the beginning. I think there's, there's some options that are kind of free, um, but then you have um, like more pay pay for the input for the number of images and so i think there's been some evolution in that as well and so i think um Cyric uses uh capturing reality which is free for educational institutions and so that is what we encourage our partners to use um on the projects that we that we do terrific thank you hey i'm going to turn to a couple of audience questions i've got one for henna here uh audience member writes how does guesso determine what sites or locations to create content about how do you make sure that it is accessible and that the stories you choose to record are inclusive, especially in a place like New York City? That's a really great question and something that we're, um, that is very top of mind for us. Um, of course, in a city as diverse as New York, um, there's so many layers and different people's perspectives. Um, someone could have a totally uh, uh, different focus for um, the way they tell the story of a place. Um, as illustrated in my personal example. Um, how we uh, address this is we partner with um, different organizations and nonprofits that are already are really focused on uh, oral history. We're also about to put out a call for, um, uh, for proposals or a call for um, submissions actually for um, stories uh, about New York, stories about local heroes. Um, or New York memories. And so with that, uh, hoping to fill the gap of our own production teams, um, limited uh, bandwidth, of course. Um, what really uh, our process is um, knowing uh, the, uh, looking at some of the countercultural movements and looking for stories that inspire us. Um, most of what you, what you heard about today was developed um, actually in 2020. And um, we realized that as New Yorkers, half of the city emptied out, but we, we stayed and we realized there was so much inspiration um, to be sourced from resilient New Yorkers or resilient individuals who came before us. So it was really, um, I think, humbling and rewarding to map those stories and continue to add to it. Terrific, thank you so much. All right, let's take a look here. I think we've got a couple more audience questions. Um, Ha, here's an interesting one um, for Casey. Um, how does SciArc contend with the likes of Google Culture? There we go, I'm unmuted. Um, and Google, is that Google Arts and Culture? Is that- I, I think that's probably what they meant, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm not quite sure. Google Arts and Culture is a platform, I think, that cultural institutions use to to share their, I think it's artistic, um, like photographs or images. Cyark is a is a user of Google Arts and Culture as a platform to share um, the materials that we produce. They have a 3D viewer that kind of fits into their platform. I think. Um, you you apply to become a member of Google Arts and Culture, and then um, then there is some some process. I think a, a vetting. Um, Casey, I think we're having trouble hearing you. 
um, to share our material. Sometimes um, we have internet. Oh, unfortunately, I, I think Casey is frozen. Can I, I can't hear you, Casey. Okay, sorry about that. Um, here we go. I think Casey's trying to reconnect here. Let's see if we can get him in back again. Okay, well, I'm sorry to say, I think we've lost the connection, uh, but of course that's that's a welcome to the year 2021. <laughs> um, I'm checking out my questions. I think those are all the audience questions we have thus far. So considering that we are just about out of time and it's a Friday, uh, why don't we go ahead and, and wrap up the meeting? Let me thank, uh, give my, my big thanks to Meridian and also to our, our three speakers in this panel. They were all terrific presentations. I really appreciate your time and uh, putting in all the, the important work that you do in the, in the cultural heritage and digital humanities um, universe. So thank you all very much. And everybody, please have a terrific weekend. Thank you so much. Well, I'd like to thank everyone around the world today for joining the Global Humanities Initiative, uh, the partnership with uh, National Endowment for the Humanities and Meridian Center for Cultural Diplomacy. Uh, it was a meaningful day. We learned a lot, and it's only the beginning of this multi-year partnership where we hope to continue to explore the themes which have been raised, explore new ones, and focus on the power of cultural diplomacy to unite people uh, in the United States uh, and abroad. And I think uh, people throughout the United States uh, all share an interest uh, in international culture, be it from their own historical perspectives and personal stories, their communities uh, in America, and, and obviously our role in the world as a partner and leader uh, in, uh, in the global uh, economy and uh, in advancing uh, peace and prosperity. So thank you again for joining us.